Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, October, what is the date here? Uh, 20, 27, thank you. Meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, as always, we begin our meeting with general public comments. Is there anybody out there who is interested in commenting on things other than the proposals in front of us? No. So moving right along to approval of minutes, of which I believe we have none. Is that correct, Sarah? Not this time, no. Not this time. So that's that's the quick one. A chair's report is quick because there is none. So we are moving right along here. The purpose of the meeting this evening is to meet with four of the applicants uh, for this round, this fall of 2021 uh, CPA funds. Last, Tuesday, last Wednesday, we met with five uh, applicants. This evening, we're meeting with four, and we're going in this order. The pickleball feasibility uh, study is first. Housing for the disabled homeless is second. Historic Northampton is third, and Michelson Galleries is fourth. So that's the order on our agenda, and uh, hopefully, uh, applicants were aware of that. Um, as uh, folks or ap applicants should know, we received your proposals. Thank you very much, of which we have read. Uh, we asked questions which were submitted by Sarah to you, of which you got back to us. So we have read those as well. So do know that we, uh, we are informed as to your proposal, but we look forward to hearing what else you have to say, and then we will follow up with questions that, that we have. Uh, next Wednesday, November the 3rd, is our public comment session. So all the applicants out there, we encourage you to get your folks uh, involved and attending this meeting, if they are so inclined, or if you are so inclined to uh, speak to the proposal. So that is Wednesday, uh, uh, November the 3rd at 7 o'clock uh, here on Zoom. So the more comments we can get, the, the happier we are. Uh, two weeks from then, which is November the 17th, is when we will begin uh, deliberations. Assuming we don't get to that on the 3rd, and generally we try to save that for one evening, uh, we will be doing the deliberations on the 17th. Uh, and then hopefully moving that forward to city council for their approval uh, soon after that. So if applicants have any questions about any of this stuff, feel free as always to contact Sarah or to contact me and uh, we will help you out as best that we can. Uh, so without further ado, we're um, gonna begin. Brian, and Brian, before you get started, Linda's got her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Linda. Thanks. I just wanted to note that there were some materials just submitted by uh, the independent housing applicant, have not had a chance to review them and feel um, somewhat ill prepared as a result. Just want to note that. Thank you, Linda, for bringing that up. Did folks get that, uh, this relatively late email from Sarah? And I think there were maybe nine or 10 additional uh, materials sent by the independent housing solutions, some of which is the revised budget, others were some of the plans, um, others were budgets from, I believe, Mana Kitchen regarding some of the furniture and from the landscaper. I think there were two different build out uh, proposals that were submitted. So as Linda said, it was a lot of material and not all of us perhaps had a chance to look at it. So. Uh, that will um, decrease our ability to ask some questions, but hopefully housing solutions folks can, can, uh, can deal with that. Any other general comments before we get going? Okay, so first up is the pickleball feasibility folks. Uh, Anne-Marie, I think that's you, is that right? So yes, if you could is. guide us through that, thank you. Sure, um, I have a document to share with you. I'm not sure how you wanna do that, Sarah. Um, 
uh, whatever you prefer. I can share or you can. Okay, you can share it if you want. Okay. It's easier. Sure, let me get and you don't have to give me the access. So I guess um, I can just start with uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, I'm Anne Marie Mojo. For those of you I haven't met, I'm the director of the city's uh, Parks and Recreation Department. So what you've taken a look at so far is our proposal for a feasibility study for pickleball courts in the city. Um, this is just a couple. Let's see. That's the end of it. Go back to the first one. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so that's um, the first page, just that uh, we're submitting for the feasibility study. You've all seen the different um, letters that people have written and emails people have written in support. So just wanna tell you a little bit about pickleball. Um, if you haven't looked it up yet or haven't played it before, it's a really fun sport. It's a lot like tennis, badminton, and ping pong kind of all together in one. It's played on a court that is smaller than a tennis court. It's a badminton size court for those of you that played badminton in the past. And it's played with a paddle and a plastic ball. You can see that on the pictures there. Um, and you play doubles or singles. And pretty much it started out as a, a real popular program for active adults and retirees because it's less demanding and um, than perhaps tennis is for some people. And so it's evolved though over the past few years, it's become huge across the US. It's, um, there are massive pickleball tournaments and courts and, and centers all over, um, especially in the South that you'll see. And they've been popping up all around Massachusetts too. So um, it's something that is an alternative to tennis. Uh, tennis is still super popular. Our tennis courts are full all the time, but um, pickleball has also become very popular. You can go to the next one. This just tells you, um, this is uh, estimates of players in this since um, in 2020, this was. So you can see it did start as seniors, as I mentioned before, but it has really grown. Our schools have PE classes offer it now. So the kids are playing it um, and everybody really loves it. It's a lot of fun. If you've gotten to try it, you know that. Um, I know some of you have. It is also um, one of the highest, the fastest growing sports in the US. So as you can see on there, it grew last year to over 4 million players in the United States. So it's, and it grew up 21% in a year. So it's really one of those up and coming, um, explosive, fun recreational sports that everybody can do. Next one. So this is what a pickleball court looks like. You also had a picture in your packet. You get the green, the big green part, um, on the top there, I mean, on the outside there is pretty much what a tennis court size is. And then you can see that the blue pickleball is a little bit smaller. So what you can do is you can fit pickleball on each side of a tennis court. So you can have the same kind of space and you can put two courts on it. Um, the bottom picture shows courts that were actually built in West Springfield in the past couple of years. And um, those are super popular also there. And their, their park and rec put those in down there in one of their parks. So this study um, that we're proposing would identify, uh, we'd study throughout the city of city owned parcels. It would identify five of them to develop to, um, that we think we could develop six courts of pickleballs on, six pickleball courts on. Um, it will need to include courts, fencing and associated parking. We're really hoping to find a spot that already has parking available that we'd be able to utilize during the day. Um, some of our, you know, some different areas are, are really popular in the evenings, but during the day, um, they're not, not as much activity going on with youth sports. So um, like our tennis is used heavily early morning throughout the day and the, when it's good weather. So also this report will include site, will evaluate all those sites, um, schematic designs that will be done. And then um, we'll have a result, we'll have opinion of probable costs for the different sites. And then part of the study will also be a public presentation of the results and the possible locations to get everyone's feedback and see where it would best be located. Next one. So this is what, as I already mentioned for it, um, 
what it would cost about $13,000. We would do a kickoff meeting, um, do the um, work with the planning department ourselves and look around the city for different parcels that it could possibly be put at. And then um, do, like I said, the public presentation at the end. And the last slide is just a couple pictures of what it looks like. So you can see all ages play. It is really something that um, has taken off for in, in our whole area. There's courts, new courts that have been put in Southampton. There people play. We actually did indoor indoor program last year, well, pre-COVID actually. We did an indoor program, which was hugely popular. Pick up, people just come, they rotate in. Um, either doubles or singles on the court. And it's just something that people just thoroughly enjoy. You can take that off if you want. So that is pretty much, I mean, I, I don't wanna go through the whole application. I know that you've seen it already and uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions on what you've seen so far or heard from me. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, questions for Anne-Marie? Martha? Yes, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Anne-Marie. That was a um, thorough presentation. I don't know that much about the sport, so it's great to get a tutorial. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, so just so I'm clear, um, you are, you're looking to develop just one site. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, okay. six, six courts at one site. One site, okay. And... Um, have you, you showed that one picture, I think it was of West Springfield where they actually put the courts over a um, regulation tennis, tennis court. Um, has there ever been an instant, instance where both activities are shared in the sense that um, there's some sort of like a movable pickleball platform or whatever that could be put over the tennis court and removed? Do you know what I'm saying? Like a flexible, making it a flexible space. Yeah, absolutely. Actually that look park, has that now they have their tennis courts there and they have painted some um half of them i believe it is for pickleball and so they have and they have the nets down there and so some people come and play pickleball and some people play tennis um we currently so you know for, for the city part so there's look park courts and then the city has courts at jfk middle school tennis courts um there are six courts here at jfk and those are used heavily like our tennis programs were after during COVID and after COVID were overfilled this summer and fall. And also the schools use them, their high school teams use them. Uh, we thought about putting lines down for pickleball, but um, the tennis teams didn't really want them per se for um, kind of for, for in case it messed them up for their lines, but also people aren't really allowed on campus during the school day. So mm -hmm. they wouldn't be able to be used for pickleball really, you know, most of the year because um, you're not technically supposed to be on campus and, and the kids are out there during the day and whatnot. So um, those are the only other courts that we have. Um, Smith College has courts. I'm not sure if they've thrown pickled out ball. I don't think they have put any pickled ball, ball down there. Um, but so far, that's what we we have in our town. Okay. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> other questions for anne -Marie? I have two questions. Jana? Um, one, just to follow on Martha's question, so completely understood about why you wouldn't want to add them to JFK. I guess, have you considered building tennis courts that can double as pickleball, pickleball courts as part of this project? So adding on to the stock of tennis courts and having the pickleball lines on top of them. My second question is, I believe that one of the sets of materials that was sent um, by the uh, firm that will do the feasibility study had sort of two options. You could either explore three sites or explore five sites. Um, what is the, what's the motivation to do five? I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, so first question, we did not look at it as tennis courts. Um, those would be a little bit bigger and take up a little bit more space. And really because we have them and Look Park has them, we just felt like a dedicated pickleball facility would really be um, 
better used and more, used more. And, and there are a bazillion t- pickleball players, which you'll probably see next week, um, who are really dying to get some some dedicated facility for them, for themselves to use um, for all the groups. And then number two, oh, for the five sites. So we really wanted to take a look as, at as much as we can. And so that was the reason for the five sites. I didn't want to whittle it down, you know, to something that maybe we didn't expand out as far as we could or look at as many. And in the past, when we've looked for different sites, when we've done presentations and things, people, you know, always wanted us to be a little more thorough and make sure we looked at as much as we can. So I think that was what our thought was with going with the five and doing as many as we can. Other questions for Anne-Marie? Yeah, Brian, uh, I, I got one. Chris? Emory, thanks for uh, coming in. Thanks for your time. Um, so assuming you're gonna move forward and I, I think I think we, we know you are, um, have you, and it, without knowing what the location is gonna be, it's, it's it, I know you can't estimate what, what the cost of the project would be, but have you started thinking about how you're gonna fund um, the, actual, the actual location? Yeah, sure. Good question. Um, we've had a lot of the pickleball players in the past um, anticipating helping out with fundraising. So they are raring and ready to go to really get some kind of community fundraising program going. And then there's different grants out there um, through all different, there's um, USA Pickleball, I believe it's called, um, and other different pickleball organizations. So there's different kinds of uh, things out there for us to look into. And I, I really think there's such a huge backing for this that there will be a lot of great fundraising with the group. They've, they've been on us for a few years for this. <laughs> so. All right, thank you. Yep. My assumption, however, is that you will be coming back to us for at least some of that money. Is that correct? I would assume so, unless um, some, you know, something other comes along, but I would assume so for something. Great, thank you. Um, why is it called pickleball? Actually, there's a whole, uh, Julia might know, Julia is a pickleball player, but ah. it was where, where it was invented, um, two brothers, I it's believe. Outside of Seattle, Bainbridge Island. Yep, go ahead, Julia, you probably know it better than I do. Uh, it was the dog or the cat was named Pickles. Yep, yeah. Although that's been disputed. Yeah, there's two sides to it, but a fit, but a, I think it was in the, was it in the 50s or 60s? They, they did it. Yeah, their dog was pickled or something. One of them, that was one of the sayings. And then the other one was that, that I don't, I don't remember the other reason actually. <laughs> Great, thank you. Any other questions for Anne-Marie? We are good to go. All right, well, thank you all. And so keep in mind, as uh, we mentioned on November the 3rd, Anne Marie to gather your folks sure. if they are interested in coming. It's seven o'clock. Okay, great. Right. great. So, do I have a question on that? Is that do you want people to write in to who haven't yet, or just would you rather um, people come if they if they can? I think it's up to you. We t- accept yeah. both written stuff, of which we've seen okay. a lot uh, in terms of uh, um, already in your proposal. Okay. But also having folks show up at the actual meeting is wonderful as well. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, from pickleball to independent housing solutions, moving along to the housing, the disabled homeless project. Um, I believe we have Jessica to speak to that. Is that correct? Do we have other folks as well, Jessica? Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Bossy, and um, I've got Raj here as well, who's one okay. of the, the private backers for this project. Great, good. All right, um, you're on. Thank you so much for joining us. Sure. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, all right. So I apologize for the delay in some of the documents that you got. I, I uh, understand your frustration and I will do my best to focus on really that piece. Um, most of them are just supporting documentations for the funding um, that we're lagging behind. Uh, also some budget numbers that 
were needed and were delayed because of the coronavirus issues, um, problems with, you know, materials and builders being very busy. So we got you those as fast as we possibly could. Um, so I just like to, you know, you have our application. I want to try to address some of the concerns. Um, we just came out of a really large and very overwhelmingly successful uh, community engagement meeting. And uh, we had the chief of police, the you know chief Casper was there, the mayor's office had a role. We had the um, multiple homeless support persons of the Pioneer Valley also in attendance, speaking about our experience. Independent Housing Solutions is yes, a new nonprofit. Um, however, it is being run by the in experts in homelessness, and we have um, an abundance of experience with direct contact with the houseless people of this community, um, particularly Northampton. So the new part of Independent Housing Solutions was for us to create really a collaboration under one organization to provide all of our knowledge and combined supports to the houseless community and put a housing proposal together that centers around supports as opposed to just a structure. Um, these are our collaborators. You can see it's a very extensive list. All of the folks on this list had a, a role tonight at the community engagement meeting. Um, multiple of the collaborators on this list, again, you know, are playing a direct role in providing services. I will not belabor that. Um, we have some specific match letters that have been drafted as well for specific numbers as far as the in-kind dollar amounts that are being contributed. And I will be happy to go through those. Those are in the email, just confirming that the numbers you're hearing tonight are in fact accurate and uh, real. Um, so I, again, don't think I needed to belabor the entire uh, application and I will not. Um, we are really trying to just provide supportive housing for individuals who are vulnerable in our community and will not um, be able to afford the exorbitant costs of assisted living, um, which as many of us know are aff not affordable for middle-class individuals, let alone you know houseless individuals with limited incomes. When I talk about vulnerability, um, I think it's important to help the CPA uh, committee understand what that means. Um, many people sort of assume that all homeless individuals are vulnerable because they live outside. And that is not the case. Uh, many houseless individuals are extremely savvy and very capable. Um, they're certainly capable at surviving, they're capable at meeting their own needs, even when um, they have to face many challenges. Um, there are other individuals who truly are vulnerable um, and they are exploited in a regular, on a regular basis uh, because of their vulnerabilities. This includes elderly individuals, so one of our oldest uh, occupants potentially coming into this building is 77. I manage the, you know, I help to manage the chronically homeless list for this region. And um, we are taking particular populations, um, you know, I, I would say we're taking, we're focusing on particular populations of individuals who um, have some of these concerns. So are physically disabled, intellectually disabled, uh, mildly, um, have medical illnesses that are just not correctly treated because of their instability. And then um, many folks are actually could be more functional, but are not because they don't have the right equipment. Um, and when they do get the right equipment, uh, it's stolen uh, very shortly after. So uh, these folks are the victims of you know, petty theft, crime, extortion. Uh, they need a, a push up the hill to get to the community meal. Somebody charges us $10. They need help getting you know, food from the store and the person takes their card and then buys a bunch of stuff for themselves. These are real, these are real examples that happen frequently. Um, we are housing a very um, 
sort of neighborhood friendly population. The neighbors are were overwhelmingly um, and just completely positive at today's meeting, and it was fantastic to see. Um, Pamela Shores says it was her the most uplifting community engagement meeting she has ever attended, um, and I'm very proud of that. And um, I just, again, these are the supports. I wanted to get to the financial piece mostly because I think that's what a lot of this meeting should be about and focused on. Um, some specifics had come up in our application regarding you know, who's really gonna be there, what are the actual structures um, on site. So here is a more concrete layout of what you're, what to expect. Um, during the daytime hours, you have visiting nurses coming twice a day to help most of these, to help some of the, you know, individuals. There's eyes, eyes in the building on a regular basis, you know, seven days a week during business hours. The visiting nurses, um, you know, I'm a, I'm, playing a medical director role in this building and will be able to respond directly to me. I sign visiting nursing orders like this big every week at my primary care practice. Um, and uh, they text me, they keep me in the loop about folks. You know, if they have a management plan that needs to change, I will be available um, like I am all the time for my own patient panel. Um, I am the one house homeless medicine doc, right, for this entire region. Um, we will provide particular housing support. And I think this was a place where I should emphasize, um, we've heard the feedback from neighbors. We've heard the feedback um, about on-site staff. We have put that into our budget. Um, it did, it, you know, it delayed our budget a little bit um, to make those changes, but we wanted to be responsive to uh, neighborhood concerns and allay any, any issues there. So there are obviously, I mentioned daytime individuals coming in throughout the, the day. So that's meal delivery from Anna Community Kitchen five days a week. We've got visiting nursing coming in, PCA support, um, caseworkers, from Elliott Services, and then we have um, a housing support specialist who's going to come to the building on in the evening hours during you know times that could be more problematic for noise or rule breaking, and uh, provide some enforcement of rules, curfews, uh, you know, noise, quiet hours, etc. Um, these are folks that are very well versed in doing this. You know, from a person who works inside the shelters. Uh, five days a week. We have to do this at every shelter, right? You have shelter staff. So we, in, we enforce rules, we help them meet their needs when, when needed, and this person would do that. There's probably going to be two individuals we've identified, um, both who have experienced, live experience with homelessness that are going to provide this role and are now housed. Um, I will just uh, emphasize again, those physical supports. Um, there was some concern about, well, how, if they're not able to meet the, their needs uh, in, the, in, in the streets, how would they meet their needs in this building? Um, and there are multiple answers to that. So you can't get visiting nursing services on the sidewalk. It doesn't work like that. So these folks need a place. They need an address to get that service. So that includes medication management, um, wound care, etc. Um, up to two days, up to twice a day, every 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 day. Um, there, we one gentleman. We I spent I spent personally uh, four years of my life uh, fighting to get him a. Uh, bariatric electric wheelchair. Uh, we were finally successful. It's approximately a $20,000 piece of equipment. Um, and uh, it was stolen about three months after we finally obtained uh, this electric wheelchair, which should come with some maybe theft, <laughs> anti-theft equipment. Um, but this way, this individual will get what he needs and be able to keep it safe. Um, and there will be anti-theft <laughs> uh, installed in this next one. So so um, our, we're designing, um, I'll just go back, it's really like a sheltered healing environment for folks to get better. Uh, we wish that there was a respite for houseless individuals uh, struggling with um, complex medical needs or even acute medical needs that just need time to heal. 
but there is there's no such thing exists in, in all of Western Mass. Um, but Boston has an amazing uh, respite program, which is where I trained. Um, I had the you know experience of being a part of the best homeless medicine uh, organization in the country, and I am doing my absolute best to bring those practices to Western Mass. Um, this is our version, uh, our first step in that direction, which is to provide ultra supported housing um, to folks. And we hope that maybe in the future, we work towards like a rapid rehousing project where someone medically stabilizes for a year or two and then moves on to more uh, you know, permanent supported housing. Um, security, I think we've mentioned, but it has been, it was a, one of the questions. So I wanted to make sure you got a concrete answer. This is our staff, you know, set up. Uh, we are going to have a property management company and we are in uh, conversation with those uh, entities, particularly HMR property management um, to provide 24 hour support on, you know, on call if there's an issue in the building. Um, the, we have a key fob system so we can monitor who comes and goes, uh, housing management, as I said, and then um, I can show you some of the, the, the designs um, in just a moment with the fence and security cameras. Um, I will note that this is a best practice across the country. Um, previous housing models generally provide, it's a very housing first, which of course we believe in, uh, but doesn't really serve a lot. It doesn't serve every individual. Um, so the first goal is to sort of create a structure and protect from the elements um, and then try to contract the needed support systems. Many of the housing developers don't really understand the exact needs of the people to be housed uh, because they don't have direct contact with those persons. So uh, that doesn't, it's not always successful. Um, our concept is sort of taking it in a different approach, which is really sort of how life forms and organisms are formed. It's starting from the, the core, it's starting from the beginning. It's identifying the needs and having direct face-to-face -face contact with these with these people. Um, you know, we understand as a as a collaboration every detail about the, the people that are to be housed here. We understand their physical needs, their uh, mental health needs. Uh, you know, Lee from Mana knows if they're allergic to onions or not. Like we know everything um, about them. We also know their entire history and what they really what they need. So, um, as organizations, we've we've individually developed very uh, robust services for each prong of those uh, of the you know sort of diagram I showed you. Um, and instead of one entity trying to sort of reinvent the wheel, we are all coming together as, and using our combined extensive knowledge to provide everything needed for these clients. So we connected with those solutions, we implemented a similar process and plan and support service in um, Florence. We know that we function very well together. We were able to reduce um, ambulance calls to that complex. There was one ambulance call in all of 2021. Um, that's phenomenal news. <laughs> I am so proud of that number. Um, and we then provide the services needed. And after we do that, then you create a structure around this already functioning entity. And that is where the five Franklin building comes in. Um, so we have been working directly with abutters. I've met with all three abutters, 219 Elm, 211 Elm, um, 7 Franklin. 7 Franklin gave us a, was initially hesitant and gave us a resounding um, uh, endorsement just an hour ago. We were very grateful. Um, we have worked with them to create this, this plan, this site plan um, for, which involves a lot of changes. Um, I worked with the 219 family as well as 211 together to redraw, redraw some property lines and we will have a, a formal surveyor come out and do those. Um, this is the, the template. We are removing uh, a, you know, an easement that's been a problem for, for 30 years or more, um, actually give, giving more property to the, new, the 219 um, side. This gray area you see is actually our property. We are giving all of that to splitting it between 211 and 219. They decided on where that line would go as a, as a pair uh, with us there. Um, we've 
responded to the needs of fencing and have added those into the plans. Um, our, our tenants will be in this back area here, which is currently like a broken down um, parking lot. And it will be sort of covered with green spaces, new arborvitae to provide seclusion, a fence. There will be raised uh, planting areas for gardening. Um, and I can tell you these tenants will do that. Um, tenants in SROs are um, a community. They decorate for Christmas. They have Thanksgiving dinner together. Um, they are proud of where they live. And um, we know that to be true of the tenants going into this building as well. Um, you've seen the common space plans. I don't need to go over any details. I just wanted to um, emphasize again, um, things like the TV room don't exist in other SROs. There's no diversion area, there's no entertainment space, um, which can lead to problems um, down the line. We are incorporating that. Um, we have, you know, medical space as well as, you know, that will be shared space with administrative staff. The uh, housing support specialists will utilize this space as well as case managers and other support entities. So building out fixed space for um, supports is very new. That's not available anywhere else in Northampton. Um, and then again, just being mindful of, we understand the needs of these individuals so well, we get even like how they will toilet. Um, and they actually have some specific needs on how that might occur. So we have de design space um, to where that would, where we can accommodate a range of, of needs. Um, which generally is not the case when, when you're looking at other um, developments. Um, all right, so funding, which is definitely a huge part of this call. Um, you know, as far as leveraging other resources, we think we've done an excellent job at doing that. Um, we have applied through for HUD funding for the vouchers. Uh, I mean, that's that's an operational cost that leads to you know tens of thousands of dollars in rental assistance as well as um, operations money in the amount of eighty eight thousand dollars. That is a that was a new um, that you know process wasn't available when we initially gave our budget, so we had to amend it, um, and that is available. And I'm happy to go through that um, for a few moments with you after. Um, we're in active discussion with Cooley Dickinson. Um, Jeff Harness is meeting with the CEO on Friday. Uh, they've already uh, sort of approved this or talked about it with the chief financial officer in order to back our entire operating costs for the uh, entire three, the first three years, uh, which is, you know, we're uh, forecasting that we will be completely on our feet with um, over six months of operating costs by year three and um, be able to, you know, uh, sort of float our own boat, uh, if you will. Um, the, the federal funding is a reimbursement type of process. So that is the, that's the reason for the need. You know, you have to start with something and then be, you know, have and be reimbursed later on. Um, and they've been very gracious and, and excited about that opportunity. Um, I would just again recognize we have a bunch of in-kind matches uh, totaling there's a four forty thousand dollar you know furniture donation um, through the Hampshire County homeless individuals and uh, that number was finally sort of uh, put forth later last week so you have that in your uh, in the email as far as that um, commitment and then you have three letters uh, match letters total that will provide an annual commitment of $66,658 um, in resources. Uh, so that basically allows this operation to continue um, to function. We have a, a backing letter in case we fall short on build out or other, you know, other in other spaces from Reliance Holdings Corporation. We uh, have uh, Raj here who has generously you know, offered to purchase this building as a private sale um, through his LLC to take advantage of this rare property opportunity. This property used to be a nursing home and it is exactly, it's built for exactly what we want it to do. Um, we did look at, we, Raj and I have been in the process of looking for buildings for about two and a half years um, through our work together. 
we considered the uh, Sunnyside building uh, that was not appropriate. Um, we considered the old, um, you know, Northampton nursing home uh, that also was not feasible. This came around and it was like perfect. And those are, that's the reason for sort of the timely issues that we've faced during this process. Um, we decided to move forward with this opportunity um, about three weeks before the 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 um, application was due for the fall. So we did the best that we could in a very short time frame. Um, I would just say we're coming to you for a one time um, a one time ask uh, it, to help to just restore the building and make it suitable for what it's being used for. Um, I'll get you the numbers as to why we're asking for the six hundred and eight thousand um, dollars. One one number I would love some numbers I would love to share with you, and this should be on a slide. Um, however, I feel I realize I overlooked that um, was is that we're aware of who's going into this facility. Um, we have two individuals that Raj and I both paired with and uh, one that I did sort of on my own in a different in this community that are almost identical in nature to two of the individuals that are slated to go into this building. They have the same like profile and need. They are the extreme high utilizers um, at Cooley Dickinson. I will just give you one of their numbers. Cooley has been kind enough to run some numbers for us. Uh, the one individual had, in, I cared for him I've cared, I still care for him, but uh, it, he was unhoused, unsheltered in 2018 and 2019. During those two years, he had 70 emergency room visits in 2018. He then had 73 in 2019. Um, those emergency room visits don't even uh, include any times he were he was admitted. Uh, there's only 52 weeks in the year, so you know he's in the emergency room or in the hospital uh, more than twice a week on many occasions. Um, when I housed, when we housed this individual in a supported environment, um, he had two emergency room visits in 2020, and he had um, he's had nine in 2021 after a little bit of uh, slipping, but I talked to him today and he's doing fantastic and uh, there will be no more um, emergency room visits for this year. So um, I just wanna note that those savings alone, uh, you know, that's an ambulance transport, uh, police response generally, emergency room costs, that one person one year saves about $250,000. Um, which is like less than our operating costs. So, and that's just one. We have 16 individuals of this sort of caliber that we are working with. Um, as far as what, what we're asking of you, um, and this has been the sort of the most difficult uh, numbers to, to get to you in a timely fashion, but we feel confident we did it, uh, are the exact estimates for what we want to accomplish with your, the, you know, the funding, with the CPA funding, if we are lucky enough to uh, be eligible for some. So the initial quote we got was like a sticker shock and uh, I think was for everyone. We agreed with that. We uh, just received, a, we've received a few quotes and our lowest was um, this 393,000 to be mindful, we took the average of those numbers, um, sort of picked a middle ground, which I think is appropriate given the uh, constraints and the instability in the building world. Um, we did get an updated formal quote from the architect for 11,000. We have a landscaping quote um, uh, and then estimated labor costs. We have uh, an exact quote for the uh, fire sprinkler system and then a pending quote, which is approximate per square foot with Loomis for $14,000. And these together, oh, I'm sorry, uh, equal this $608,000 uh, that we have requested. I am happy, those are really just the, what's what you were emailed. So I'm happy to take any questions you have. I'm sure there will be questions. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Bossi. Uh, Dan, question? Uh, Dr. Bossi and Raj, th thank you for your, your service and advocacy for homeless individuals. I, I previously served on the, the Northampton Housing Partnership and 
applaud your innovative model uh, for, for housing and care, your impressive fundraising coalition building, outreach to the project's neighbors. And my question is, uh, what percentage of Northampton's disabled houseless population do you expect the facility to serve or any, any ballpark on that? And do you expect you'd be able to expand the facility in the future or build others in the community to, to serve more houseless individuals? That's a great question. Raj, I can take that. Um, so I'm just thinking of the, um, I'm thinking of the list, uh, the coordinated entry list, which is how we define vulnerability uh, and the individuals on that. I mean, there are 240 individuals on that list, but the, not all of them are the kind of folks we're talking about. I would say in this immediate vicinity um, at being really the, probably the most versed in this, uh, in answering this question, we're talking about as far as physically disabled, homeless individuals housing uh, somewhere between 50 and 60% of the folks that you see on the streets with walkers, wheelchairs, I mean, folks that have electric wheelchairs, et cetera. Um, there is an absolute paucity of ADA housing. You're aware of that. Um, and then we're also uh, just targeting, again, vulnerable individuals. I think that's that number we're definitely um, you know, say there's eight rooms left uh, after housing the uh, more complicated folks who are disabled. Um, you know, the more vulnerable we're talking probably, you know, 20% of those individuals. Um, and these are folks, please know, this list includes three counties worth of, of, of individuals. So uh, it's hard for me to give you an exact estimate of folks that are, you know, going to be taken directly out of Northampton downtown, but all of these folks going into this building are, are considered Northampton residents. They consider Northampton their home. Um, and as far as your question about moving forward, yes, we have so many ideas for this, and it's not at this building. Um, so this building will remain the way that it is um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, we want projects that are less than 20, 20 people. Uh, smaller projects do much better, and you can provide really um, um, robust support per tenant with that model. Um, our next project, we've are you know we've we looked at other models. We wanted to start do everything at once, but that wasn't appropriate, obviously. Um, so we've looked at a other complexes. One is downtown, right two blocks from my office, next to the police station. Um, that address if it's still available by some random chance, uh, could be used particularly to house the very, very mentally ill. Um, that project would have um, about 11 occupants and um, eight to 11, depending on how it goes, um, and then a 24 hour staff member. Um, it's not in a neighborhood, it's in a more appropriate location for individuals who may have more um, disruptive behaviors and is, located in a correct space. And then I also mentioned the idea of a rapid rehousing project that would allow um, folks, for example, like who need a hip replacement. This is a classic problem I come across um, who really need a hip replacement and are so disabled, but have nowhere to recover from a hip replacement and get back on their feet. So no one will operate on them. Uh, that would be a perfect example for a rapid rehousing project that would provide the same types of supports that I'm talking about, but only for but for a restricted time frame, um, like one year, two years, depending on what was the model was, and then move that individual who now can walk again um, into independent living, into much more independent housing. Thank you. You're welcome. Great work. Other questions? Uh, Linda? Thanks. Um, I, have, I have a number of questions, but maybe I'll just ask a couple and then let other people ask some and, and maybe circle back. Um, the concept is, is, is a obviously much needed, uh, a wonderful concept but I feel like we're kind of watching the sausage being made. Um, and the 608,000 is a whole lot of money when we don't quite, <laughs> we're not sure that that sausage is really gonna come together. Um, so my first question is um, about the acquisition of the property. W what's the status of that? 
um, I assume that on a, a, a lot of this funding, you're not going to hear for some time. So how are you doing the sequencing and did you explore an option to purchase or was that so that you could hold the property while you lined up more of the, the many pieces that a, a project of this nature requires? So that's my first question. Sure. Um, well, I will say and just answer that I think that this, um, I would invite you to watch the community engagement meeting that occurred. Um, one of the comments from the CSO, from one of the, a but from one of the neighbors, um, Nick Fleischer was, um, I am just so blown away by the support for this project and that all of our, the heads of our community have, st are standing behind this. Um, together in one Zoom call. <laughs> um, so it was an amazing show of support. You have uh, everyone behind this and we've we've been doing this already for, uh, you know, as a group for years. So I don't feel like the service part is an issue. I definitely um, respect your concerns about the um, the financing of the building. Uh, we brought in a private investor, so that's Raj, he's on this call, who has a significant amount of capital. He's uh, He did provide that uh, last week, as far as you know what he's worth um, to this committee. Um, and it's you know $3.5 million. Um, he has, uh, we were in, in active conversations with Greenfield Savings Bank. The nonprofit eventually wants to purchase the building um, as a new nonprofit you know, with not a lot of fiscal history, that's not possible to do at the outset. Um, so initially, I, I think I did answer some of this in our questions, but we had discussed with Greenfield Savings Bank and we're working with the vice president of the bank um, on, on, on troubleshooting uh, is, was a, C, a, CB, a CBA loan, um, Raj, please correct me, a 504 loan. However, in the future, a nonprofit would not be eligible to take that loan over. So that was, we had to sort of come back to the drawing board. Uh, there was then uh, the 99 year um, affordable housing restriction that started to cause some issues with uh, obtaining a mortgage. Uh, it's a large risk you know, it's not a good business move for someone to invest $740,000 when it's going to immediately depreciate it, it, you know, and not be worth what was put in for, for 700, you know, for 99 years. Um, there were other issues with that as well. And that, you know, we can't oversee a property for 99 years for, you know, issues of life expectancy. So I wasn't going to sell something to the neighbors that I couldn't control or supervise. Um, I wouldn't do that to, to this community, um, which I'm very dedicated to this community. Um, we, we had changed that and we've been talking with, um, Wayne back and forth about different ways of receiving this money. And one of it was a sort of a loan um, over the course of 20 years that was gonna be, uh, you know, would, would accrue 2.5% interest um, if we defaulted on our obligations for this for this uh, purpose of housing homeless individuals. Um, however, if we maintain an, uh, our you know, due diligence in our role, the interest and 5% of the, of that loan would be forgiven each year, meaning it's a 20 year term. And at the end it's forgiven that a junior mortgage would come with an affordable housing restriction. Greenfield Savings Bank was much more, was much, was more excited about that opportunity and was uh, willing to rediscuss funding again, uh, which was great. I also made a note to them that, uh, you know, we understand it's still a risk to purchase a property with a junior mortgage with a affordable housing restriction. However, the, you know, the funding that we're getting that is attached to the, the um, affordable housing restriction is directly going into improving the equity of the property that they're buying. So we have, uh, we're currently right in the process of getting a, uh, as is uh, appraisal, and then also as a, you know, um, as built, as finished appraisal, uh, all of that equity would be directly uh, given to the non, would be assigned to the nonprofit. And we would have that um, as equity when we 
purchase the building um, and be able to sort of buy Raj out. Raj can speak to his own agenda, but he plans to retire in five years and uh, go island hopping. So uh, wants to, <laughs> he wants to uh, sell the property to the, the, the nonprofit. Um, you know, do it. I want to also just mention we're doing this really quickly. I think a lot of that's very jarring for folks in this process. Yeah, they're like, what is happening? Um, but I'll also remind you that probably 50% of the occupants that would be going into this building will be dead in, in the timeline that it would take to do it uh, differently. So, you know, we don't have time for a, a you know, site, uh, serve, you know, um, the, the pickleball, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, you know, a feasibility survey and years to, um, you know, fundraise. We are putting options money on the table for the property to keep it available uh, if needed. We are working with a housing developer to make sure we get this right, because that would be sort of our one weakness. Um, we are a service side, uh, not necessarily a development side, but we do have a lot of support in that now. We were able to so, redesign our, bu our budget with the. With so, that so, my question was whether you had explored an option, and you're saying you'd explored it, and is that a possibility? I, I'm really trying to figure out when this building is going to be purchased. Yes, by December if, 31st. Excuse me? By December 31st is our, is, yes, our, is our deadline. And when do you expect to hear about all of the, your funding, the continuum of care funding and the other funding? Uh, so that grant is currently, I can have to pull up the timeline for you on that. The COC funding is currently under review uh, by the, the committee, by the same type of committee. Um, and I will chat with, um, I can ask Kelly to get you a more exact answer. Um, it would be in the middle of November is, I can't remember the exact day, but that would be the timeline. The, the funding for that would not be available until July 1st, which is why our move-in date is July 1st. But, but HUD has to make the final decision, so it has to go to HUD as well, right? It's not just an internal... Um... Correct, yeah. So that's why the funding doesn't get allotted to us, uh, doesn't get to us until uh, July 1st. I But again, those are all operations costs and... Um, those are the housing vouchers that are being used to, to eight of them are project-based vouchers. Um, there's a lot of other kind of vouchers that I already have spoken with the, um, you know, housing list about emergency housing vouchers. We've got people with MRVP vouchers. We've got a lot of different types of options, mostly the um, emergency housing vouchers to utilize as well. Um, those are good for 10 years. There's um, 32 of them available right now. Um, so there, there are quite a few, there are quite a few options for that, for the, that type of problem that we've, that I don't feel like will be an issue. You actually have two letters of support from both of the housing gift voucher gifters that stated in their letters that they would ensure. That I'm, I'm going to ask my question once again, the, yes. have you explored an option to purchase the property, which would allow yeah. you, uh, allow, allow you more time not a purchase and sale agreement, but an option to purchase so that you would have the right for a period of time. you not be bound to purchase it, but you would have the option to purchase it. Um, yes. yes, actually yeah. we are going to rent the property. We are going to pay the rent for uh, a period of time till we get everything streamlined. Or we have another option like private funding. We are going to probably buy the whole building with private investors and then think about the possibilities of funding. Uh, either ways, we are going ahead with this project because uh, we, we definitely step, we are going to move forward because we have experienced this one. I already run a River Valley Rest Home for four years and uh, it is tremendous success and we house so many individuals and uh, we, we don't want to step back. We are moving forward. Um, so you mentioned, um, Dr. Basu, that you've engaged a housing developer, a consultant, and who is that? Um, I, will I will allow that person to remain anonymous. <laughs> um, 
I, I don't, that, that person may or may not be uh, on this call. So <laughs> I need to respect that, uh, but. I'm, I'm uh, not sure I quite understand that, I'm sorry. Well, um, I will allow that person to name themselves if they so choose. Um, but yes, we are in direct consultation with one of the largest housing developers and one of the most, um, I don't know. So Laura, you want, to talk, you want to talk to that? <laughs> <What was> that? <laughs> oh no, <laughs> I'm sitting in bed <laughs> with my dogs. <laughs> I can't um, tell that. <laughs> yeah. Laura, I just didn't want to call you out. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're, we're mighty in spirit. We're not that large. But, so um, yeah, we've, we've put our oar in the water just in the sense of trying to help advise on the housing development part of this. Um, I've been before this committee a number of times. Um, so you kind of know our, our normal protocol in our affordable housing development world. This is something different, um, but uh, I think a really valuable uh, you know, resource. Um, we struggle as housing developers to really manage um, the comprehensive kind of services that Dr. Boss is talking about. We aspire to it, um, but it's difficult. Um, so I see this as a pretty um, attractive opportunity. Um, and I, like you, Linda, I'm kind of like, whoa, <laughs> it's going fast. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, we don't all have to develop in the same way. If, if this is a big problem, needing many different types of solutions. I mean, when I heard Dr. Bossy say, we want to build small, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, we want to build big, you know, just like, but it, it, it takes all kinds um, to solve a problem that's so intractable. And so I would, I would definitely encourage the committee to, to support the project. Um, and I know it's a big ask for the committee. I, I, I feel like, you know, especially Linda, you know, sometimes we come in and, and the comment is, why do you need our money of all the state money? But this one doesn't, <laughs> this one doesn't have state money, you know, for better or worse. And there's a real compromise between time and money. They're gonna bring units in at a cost that's phenomenally low um, and move very quickly, um, but they're not bringing in the big capital that, that we work with you know, through the state. So yep. it really well, is I'm, a very different model. I'm, uh, different models are good and I'm, and I'm really pleased to know that, that you've now stuck your oar in this water. How, how deep are you sticking it? Because my, my real concern is that the numbers seem to keep changing the, it's, it's a wonderful concept. It, I have no doubt but that it is desperately needed the support services are really impressive. It's yeah. it's the nitty gritty of how you how you acquire, renovate, and keep operationally sound. That I I, I really want to make sure, given this level of investment, um, it yeah. is there. I, and well, and the numbers have just been jumping around too much and seem to un unformed. So. What's, right. how, how deep are you sticking that ore in the water? So we're, uh, you know, I've offered to help because I believe in the mission. Um, we're not, have not been asked to be a, a, a partner and I don't think we need to be um, in this particular model, um, but we'll, we'll offer whatever level of support and expertise we can in terms of just what you're talking about, kind of the reality check on the numbers. Um, mm -hmm. There is a lot of community support. So, you know, we all want to do a lot of due diligence, but when you see a project like this that will um, be able to pull in resources as it goes along, I mean, I mean that's what I see. I, I see that it's going to be able to raise money and raise money from sectors that we have not been able to reach. So the, the deeper pockets having to do with the healthcare industry which somehow have become entirely disconnected from, you know, shelter housing, low-income housing, you know, where they're desperately needed. Um, I'm hoping I learn a lot um, from this model and that we can, we can cross-pollinate. 
we can offer some of our housing development expertise in this particular example, and then we can suck off some of the, the ways to pull service and especially healthcare service dollars into our other um, high need SRO population. I just wanna piggyback off of that as far as how, who it, um, how we're getting funding. Um, so because of my connections in the healthcare world, and I definitely appreciate uh, Laura sort of making that more clear, the, the folks that are benefiting from this are the, a lot in, in large part are the insurance companies. I have two large meetings with uh, the main insurance companies. One of them is tomorrow um, to give us support dollars for these high utilizer individuals who cost them hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. They are in agreement with giving us stipends, um, you know, helping us with the acquiring the durable medical equipment. Um, we're talking about some of those dollar amounts um, later tomorrow. Uh, and there will be a lot of funding coming in uh, as well from private sectors. Um, I'm going to be going on the Bill Newman show to ask for additional private donations um, on November 9th at 9am. So that's coming up. Um, we've done our best to really just ask for one thing and that's to get the building renovated. And so it's ready to pe for people to move in. Um, the longer we wait on that, um, the more people die of frostbite and, uh, you know, <laughs> hypothermia and all these other, you know, chronic problems that I have to face every day. Um, so this is, it's needed, it's needed now. And I, th I think there's no way that Raj and I will not buy this building. <laughs> if we, if we, we will buy it, and then if we have to get only f private, you know, funding over the years, uh, potentially we do that. But um, we would really encourage the city to take a step in the right direction. I mean, there's the, the, the occupants of this city are, are frustrated. They're, they're angry that the Pulaski Park is overrun and there's tents everywhere and I can only do so much on my own. <laughs> I would Other just question? throw in that I think the building itself, the, the, the fact that it's, it's a pre-existing building in good condition that is a fairly light um, reno back to its nursing home roots. Um, the location is good. The, <laughs> I would have said the neighborhood could be a challenge, but I was at the meeting earlier tonight and they've pretty much come over. Um, and, and that's huge in our world. Um, that's just one of our, our biggest challenges um, to overcome is, is neighborhood resistance. So, and it's a good deal for the money. Thank you, Laura. I'm gonna go back in the shadows. I'm sorry, <laughs> I feel terrible. <laughs> Other questions? Laura. Other questions for Dr. Bazzi or for uh, Mr. Dry, I believe. Is that how you say your last name? He goes by Raj. Raj, okay. Other questions? Jen? Um, could you talk a little bit about what would happen in that five year period if sort of at that time of wanting to transfer ownership to the nonprofit, if that's not financially feasible for whatever reason for the nonprofit at that time? Yeah, Raj, why don't you answer that? We've talked about it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, it's not like a set date that five years, after five years, I'm going to be gone. So I, it, it's, it's my plan. It's, it can be extended. Our, you know, we did provide, in, and that's the thing you'll need to vet, uh, Laura, thank you for helping us. She really provided a great template for a housing development budget, which is something we did not know how to create on our own. Uh, so we utilized her wonderful expertise in creating a realistic budget that includes 20 years of, of projections um, and really, I think, highlights the, the matches that we're getting, the initial budget sort of just was low because we know all of these support services are coming in, including those from the Hampshire uh, County Friends of the Homeless Individuals. They're supporting an enormous amount of our um, 
of our operating costs, including um, replacement reserves, uh, and they've, they've committed to doing that for 10 years. Um, that's an enormous amount of funding. They are providing um, all of the cleaning supplies, the paper goods, office supplies, um, a lot. You'll see on the budget, it's like outlined into what our operating costs really are, and then what actually independent housing solutions is really only responsible. Um, and I'm happy to share my screen and show you that whatever you need me to do. Um, the budget also includes the, you know, the property management fees and then the uh, 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 salary for a support person to be in the building. Um, I think what we are looking at now is very realistic um, and actually turned out to be better than even what I had sort of envisioned, <laughs> uh, which was great. It looks like we'll be sort of on our feet within three years, which is why I asked Cooley for the, the three-year backing. So is that uh, in the materials that were, were just sent? Okay. Yes, it is. I'm very sorry that it was so uh, delayed, but Laura was an amazing resource and we only connected recently via Pamela Schwarz and she jumped right in the same day to be like, let me help you with this budget. So uh, thank you again, Laura. Other questions? I'm just curious how you are funded. And since you seem to be central to all of this, you know, what happens if you get hit by a bus or something? Great question. Um, I've got a pretty good life insurance policy. I'm happy to join some of that, but um, <laughs> I, I'm, I work for health services for the homeless, which is a grant <clears throat> organization that serves this entire region. It's a federal grant. Um, I'm doing this on my own time. I'm not getting paid to do this. I've invested <clears throat> like hundreds of hours at this point in my found time as a full-time working single mom of three uh, to make this happen. Um, and I think, you know, you're not, I wish that the, if I called them right now, all of the support people, Lee, Kate, Tara, you know, uh, Katie Renicki, HMR Housing, they would immediately jump on this call. Um, I'm not working alone. I'm just sort of the spokesperson. I'm also the person that connected all of us sort of together. And now we're this enormous strong entity. We piggyback on each other all the time. We speak almost literally daily. Um, I was looking for somebody the other day because I needed to, and I had five organizations throughout the city. <laughs> we found that person. So it was like so easy. Um, we really work. We do amazing work in this, in this community. We're the experts, honestly, and we are so proud to be able to try and make this a real. If I get hit by a bus, somebody else will take my place. I, there's lots of, there's not any, there's not a lot of me, but uh, my position will be filled. And um, I have, I have a care team in Northampton that's very committed to this, to this aim, including my nurse, my, my community outreach worker. We have another outreach nurse that's extremely um, committed to this project and could help, you know, ease someone into the role easily. Dr. Kate Ewell could also take over. And it's a very rare situation that both of us would die. <laughs> and she works at Cooley. <laughs> Other questions? Jeff? Um, thank you for the presentation. I, I haven't read the email either, so I need to get up on running speed on that. But um, when you said earlier that <clears throat> um, Cooley Dickinson um, has backed you for three years. What does that translate into? What does that mean? So we're still in that, that process. Their CEO is brand new. It's her fourth week. So um, this was a, this had to be done sort of delicately uh, given the time constraints, but the CEO is being made aware of this possibility. Um, they, the chief financial officer, described it as a small amount of backing, um, a very doable amount of uh, funding, which basically they would, so they get money from the same pot that we're asking for from HUD actually to run a positive place and to run, um, you know, their ACO, for example, gets funding for housing. Um, so they have mon money that they would then pay out front um, and then they would be reimbursed by you know the 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 federal stuff so 
we wouldn't have to, you know, be waiting for reimbursements. Um, and they understood that model. Um, they're, they are, they did this already for a positive place um, and it works great. They understand reimbursement um, allocations, how to ask for these reimbursements and we're, we're happy to take that role. Um, petitioning and accepting reimbursements, you know, um, basically giving receipts, you know, providing, you know, providing the requests for the reimbursements is a complicated process and would be relative, would be new to us. So they, in that three-year period of time, would teach us how to do that on our own as well. So that's a big piece of this. Um, I'm sure Laura could speak to that as well, but, you know, being funded through the state or the feds uh, can be a lengthy, complicated mm -hmm. process. So we would learn that process in that period of time. So that the, the timeline is vastly different than what you submitted in your original proposal, right? So now you're talking about closing by the end of the year instead yes. of the third week of November, and you're talking about um, target grand reopening in July instead of February? Yes, we recognize that our initial timeline was like way too, it was not realistic. Uh, we're very lofty, um, ambitious people. <laughs> uh, we apologize for that. And after learning some of the sort of nitty gritty uh, and and also just obstacles due to COVID, um, you know, Raj is a private has a lot of other private developments, and he's used he's used to working really quickly like this. And so when you're asking for you know city you know municipal funding and other types of funding, private funding to get off your feet, it takes time. Um, and Laura has also helped us understand that and, um, you know, put down option money and um, work work with the property um, sellers to, to still make this a real vision, a real possibility. Okay, and, and ideally, um, the way you envision this is as, an, an initial intake of sorts for people um, with services provided, and then at some point a transition to more stable um, public housing. Is that what I heard earlier? No, that, that's a future model, like a respite type of model um, for rapid rehousing. This is permanent ultra supported okay. housing. These individuals would live here, would live there. I mean, by choice, they could always move um, okay. until they, until they, expire until they die okay and i think um uh, thank you for your questions linda that's similar to what i was thinking the way you started out so i'll leave it there for now but thank you thanks uh let me acknowledge that we're uh we're going over time on this proposal so thanks to Lori and to paul and to richard for hanging in there um Generally, we would not go as long, but this is sort of a unique proposal. It's different for us. It's a big ask. Uh, as a committee, we need to do our due diligence. So again, appreciating Lori and Paul and uh, Richard with the two proposals coming after this. But I think we're going to continue with this discussion to make sure that we as a committee uh, get our questions answered and, and again, are doing our, our, our due diligence. Uh, Linda, you had, I think, had your hand up again. Yeah, I um, wondered where you think you would be if you did not get the operations money for the continuum of care, continuum of care. I understand you're saying that there are various sort potential sources for the vouchers, but the mm -hmm. operating money is is a is a big chunk. And I don't know what the current um, budgets are, but it used to be that breaking in as a new uh, player trying to get money was difficult. Maybe that's changed, I don't know. It can be. Um, I can tell you that the, so one thing about this is that it's a medically supported model and HUD attached fun, new funding just this year and new points for um, projects that leverage healthcare dollars. That means that you have a match from a medical institution or a medical provider or healthcare organization that is 25% of what you're asking. Our region does not have a project like that. So we do not get at those extra dollars or extra points. Um, our region was very excited that I coincidentally um, came forward with this project and was like, oh my gosh, we would get quite a bit 
um, of extra points, but and that would benefit this entire the entire uh, Pioneer Valley. So um, this is why we have support, uh, you know, as far as Greenfield, Pittsfield, Springfield, you get housing authorities all over saying like we will make this happen because it is in the best interest for everyone um, to get to have this be on on the on the list of of proposals to HUD. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and then the, to answer your question, um, the operating costs that we're asking for is $88,000. I am confident with um, our connections, uh, with other housing developers, um, you know, we could always reach out to do um, a, a one-stop application uh, that doesn't, that's sort of out of the general round. We could, um, reach out to, again, Hampshire County Friends of the Homeless, see if they would increase some of their match. I think the, uh, I, again, I have this, um, so CCA, uh, the um, Commonwealth Care Alliance, which is one of the major players, um, is already doing this in Boston. Um, they have, they published a big paper. It's been a raging success. Um, the state is very excited about it. And we're meeting tomorrow. I bet if I ask them, we could get the operating costs from from them. So um, we will find it. I have no I have no doubt about that. <laughs> Thank you. Martha. Yes, thank you. Um, I had a question about your construction costs. Um, you have um, a build out quote average and both the lowest and the highest quote. And um, there's quite a discrepancy between those. And I wonder if you can um, account for that, if you, um, you actually received any quotes that were in between that. Um, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I think that's a great, that's a great question and was uh, really kind of threw us for a loop. Um, you know, we initially went with Barron and Jacobs, they provide architectural services. So their, their quote was actually, their high was 750. I didn't, I did not use that as an average. I used their lowest number, which was 660. Um, because we were able to contact the original architect for this building, uh, which took uh, quite a bit of doing um, and he signed on already had the plans and was very willing to work with us at, at a very low cost so we saved all of the sort of designing architectural stuff uh, money and so we had a middle of the road developer the Sunnyside developer um, but that person actually just took a very large project and was not didn't want to move forward with that middle quote. Um, we met with the Pittsfield builders who are quite committed to this project. Um, they're going to sort of come in from Pittsfield, stay in motels, get it done. Um, they gave us their estimates. I found it to be low. <laughs> so I I used the, the middle number to, to be safe. And in addition to that, because there is this high possibility um, and the building world is so unstable, you know, Raj has come forward with a $250,000, you know, backing letter saying like, if there's a shortfall for any reason with the CPA money, there's some money to sort of damage control and get this project going. Okay. I mean, I think if um, it would be really helpful for us to um, see a breakdown of at least the quote that you're thinking of. And the other thing to consider, I think, it, and Sarah, um, I would ask you to weigh in on this because I'm not certain about this, but if the um, city were to fund this, it would technically be public funding. And I believe that would throw this into a prevailing wage rate category, which might escalate the cost of your construction. So it's just something to consider. I think having a breakdown would be helpful to us um, in our future deliberations. And then I just had one other question. In the, um, the map that you showed, or the site plan, I guess, um, uh, there was 205 Elm on that, I believe, and I just wondered if you had had done them. I don't know who that is, but if they had, you didn't mention that as um, an abutter that was supportive or had weighed in on it. Yeah, that pro that's a good question. Um, I don't know if 205 was on the call today or in the original meeting. Uh, I can't speak to that, but that corner of property is is a is an enormous backyard uh so there's like you know probably 200 feet uh of backyard so i don't think it's uh it's not like they're close by um and so okay prevailing wage is definitely um something to consider and yeah, i'm not certain about that but i would check the, with 
the city. If the building is privately owned, it would not trigger a state procurement or prevailing wage requirement. Even if it's publicly funded? Even if it's publicly funded. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But we can get you a breakdown. Our builder's working on that right now. Thank you. Yes. There is a general breakdown um, regarding like plumbing, electricity, uh, the fire spring, the fire um, alarm system, and then the build out. He has already provided that. That is in the email that I sent you, as well as our uh, proposal. There's just not a like line item uh, breakdown quite yet, but that's in the works. Yeah. Yes. Uh, back to Linda. This is actually more of a question for, for Sarah. Um, the, the affordable housing restriction, do you have a sense that that's really been ironed out in a way that would be satisfactory to the city or is that still really up in the air? So if the project uh, involves acquisition, then an affordable housing restriction would be required by law. If it does not involve acquisition, then um, that wouldn't necessarily be required, but we definitely would need some way to protect the public funds, especially for a project that's requiring more than half a million dollars. And the, the way that that would be done has not been lined out yet. Say, say the, your last few words again. Yeah, that's the, the exact way that the, the public funds would be protected and ensure that this use continues or that the public funds would be returned hasn't been ironed out. Um, Wayne and his letter and Dr. Bossy and her response had gone back and forth with that a little bit, but that's not finalized at this point. Okay, yes. Okay. Um, just presented what Wayne had uh, sort of proposed and it was acceptable for us. We said, yes, that sounds like a great plan and we would be happy to accept that arrangement. Yeah, and so uh, sorry, uh, I think we, we would just need to discuss the details of that a little bit more. Um, Wayne's proposal was specifically for an amount of about 250. Okay. But given that the request is a little bit more, that may need some ironing out. So that's just something okay. we should continue to discuss. Okay. And Sarah, you feel confident that that will be worked out to ensure that our, our public funds are protected? Yeah, I mean, what Wayne had proposed is, is basically a, a loan that would be senior to other mortgages that would be repaid if if this property ceased to be used in the way that's proposed in the CPA application. Um, but clearly there's a, a lot of details to be discussed about that. There's a lot of different funding sources and, and a lot of other things to be considered. Great, thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, I have one, just, just so I understand. So. Dr. Bossi and Raj, this is a, a unique affordable housing project for us because there is a private uh, for-profit component to it. And to my knowledge, and Sarah can connect, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we've never engaged in a proposal with a for-profit component. Uh, and my understanding is that Reliance Holdings is that for-profit component that is actually purchasing the building. Is that the extent of the uh, of the private funding just in the building acquisition itself? And then there's a plan five years from now or within five years or perhaps longer to 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 sell to the nonprofit. It, 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 am I correct in that? Yeah, that's correct because we, we could not get the funding um, through nonprofit. We cannot get the bank loan through nonprofit. That's the main reason we are going through Reliance Holding, which is for profit, to purchase a property and then eventually sell that to nonprofit. And and how will you make money off this deal, Raj? I'm not going to make any money. I'm not trying to make money out of this. <laughs> Sorry. So it is a for you are. Reliance Holdings is a for-profit corporation yes. uh, purchasing the building with the intent to sell to the nonprofit for no profit. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, this may seem, I, I don't mean to be, uh, what's the word, condescending, insulting, or questioning, 
but how how do we know that? Um, uh, if you want anything in written, yes, I can provide you in, in writing as a legal binding document. Okay, thank you. And again, no no insult intended or <laughs> no no or no any of that. <laughs> Okay. I totally understand. I just want to. I want to be clear. I think it's helpful to understand where Raj is coming from. Um, we he he runs River Valley Rest Home, so we've collaborated in housing some of our neediest clients. I have patients that need twenty four hour care, but they can't afford assisted living, so they go to they go to Raj's rest home. But that's a federal a federal living arrangement, and so all of their social security wages are garnered. So they only get seventy three dollars of spending money. So our folks that are sort of semi able and don't actually need uh, 24 hour monitoring, but can't live totally independently either, end up just leaving the rest home. Raj has like dr driven around Northampton, um, finding people, <laughs> he's like, <laughs> you know, uh, put, put people in his own car. He's taken emergency folks who have just had strokes for me. Um, he's like a really good guy. <laughs> I, I, when I first met him, I had actually the same exact uh, concerns that you do. Um, he pulled up in a Tesla and I thought he, my patient that he brought to her appointment was like, I had a talk with her. I was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Like, I didn't know you were in the trade. Like, we've got to talk, we've got to do testing. And she's like, no, that's the rest home director. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> Who drives a Tesla and runs a rest home? So um, yes, I, I, over the four years, I've learned to really trust Raj um, and he he wants to do the right thing for, for these folks. Um, he take, I mean, and so many, the restroom doesn't even have a wheelchair ramp. He has put countless dollars in of his own money into the rest home model. He knows it doesn't work um, well. And it, it's frustrating. It's frust frustrating for both of us to not have a middle ground solution. And we're, we're really doing our absolute best as like two citizens who serve this country, uh, country, <laughs> this uh, city to provide you guys with a solution in the, in the only way we could figure out how. Thank you. Other questions? I'm just gonna follow up with on, on yours, Brian, and, and say, you know, this is a really impressive project and, and, and um, I don't think any of us question the motivation of any of the players involved, but when we're talking about being good stewards of taxpayers' dollars, yep. um, good intentions aren't simply just aren't sufficient. So we have to we have to be sure that we're in a position where where our due diligence, you know, supports the good work that you guys are trying to do. It is going to save a whole lot of taxpayers' money. Imagine like how many how much dollars are going to be saved on the emergency uh, room trips, it's, it's a lot of money. Like I, I, I actually housed one of the, the patients of Dr. Bossi a couple of years. He made like only one emergency trips um, in the past two years. Whereas like when he was on the road, he was literally like 200 trips in, in a year. That's true. Yeah. The, the police, police and fire thought he had died. He didn't die. He still lives here. He's just housed. He's just housed at, at, Raz, at the rest home. Um, I, we had a meeting with, with chief and fire and with the police and fire. And they were like, whatever happened to that guy? And I was like, we, did, we fixed that problem. <laughs> they were uh, very impressed. So um, we do really good work. We know it works. Um, we understand your concerns though. And please let us know if there's specific documentation you would like. Um, you know, we have to account for inflation. Uh, we we want to get Raj all the money that he put into this project back, and we're, he's keeping receipts. Uh, the nonprofit will will provide that to Raj for helping us with this endeavor. We have also, I just would say, we're discussing uh, taking out a commercial loan. Uh, so it's a it's a basically a um, Raj help me. Um, it's a what the loan, the four, four to five percent. If we took out um, just a simple commercial loan, a conventional loan rather, um, they would allow the nonprofit to buy it at the outset. Raj would just have to be the undersigner uh, because we don't have capital funds to put on it, but we could be like on the mortgage, for example. That would be possible. Yeah, that, that'll, yeah that'll save us some real estate taxes if yes. that works good. So we are exploring multiple options, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, definitely, we are we are motivated. We are going to go 
go on this project no matter what but definitely it's going to be really tight for us without your support it's going to be really really hard with that extra funding we can really serve the community well i just see it as with that support we can actually get started and get these people housed and it's not going to stop right here we are going to keep, keep going. doing more yeah um and we can't open July 1st if we have no money to do the build out. You know, the, the build out is supposed to happen in that sort of six month period of time, J January 1st to July 1st. Um, and it, it is a simple build out, like Laura explained. The building is already built sort of mostly correctly. So it's a minimum, it's a minimal. Be happy to take anybody on a on a site visit if you'd like. Um, Dr. Bossi and, and Raj, simple build outs in the age of COVID have become incredibly complex with supply chain issues and, and lumber, wood not coming in. Uh, once again, back to this timetable, which I know you have adjusted and pushed back, uh, given the, again, given these supply chain issues, do you feel that July 1st is, a, is still a realistic date for, for a complete build out and to begin housing residents? Yes. yes, July 1st is realistic, but Definitely. February, February is not realistic. The, bu the builder was very, comp com was very, was like, oh, that's nothing. We have till July 1st. Okay, there's no problem. Um, somebody wanted a bathroom before Thanksgiving and they said that was going to be kind of tricky, but they were going to do it. So um, I, I don't see any issues with that. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Are we good to go on this? Yes. So we have okay. many supporters coming on the third. So just be aware. <laughs> Great, good. I was just gonna sorry, remind, not sorry. remind you of that. <laughs> and for those who cannot make it, we accept written letters of support as well. Done. So Dr. Bazi and Raj, thank you uh, very much for your time and for your uh, expertise and for your commitment to such a worthwhile project for our our community um, and uh, uh, we're gonna and you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting or you're welcome to check out as well so Thank we're gonna you. move move right along uh, without further without what I'm hearing is further questions uh, and again thank you um, Betsy and Lori for hanging in there with us but we're moving on now to I want to say yet another proposal from historic Northampton for the wonderful Shepherd Barn Preservation and restore restoration project. Uh, Betsy and Lori. Hi. Good evening. Thanks for having us, and thank you for that previous um, uh, discussion. I, I learned a lot, and I appreciate listening to it. Um, so this is our third uh, proposal to you for the Shepherd Barn. This one is very specific. Uh, and very small <laughs> compared to the others. And, and Lori can describe the whole context for the project, but I'm just gonna tell you exactly what this one is for. Um, could I share my screen? I'll just hit that. Oh, I didn't do that right. Hold on a second. Get it up and then hit share screen, okay. Now the share screen isn't coming up. Hold on. Sorry. It should be. Uh, if you hit the uh, hit the green share screen. I hit the green, and now I hit the screen that I want to share. Uh, double click. Oh, there I go. Okay, thanks. So. Um, what we're asking for this time is money for the conservation work of several of the historical artifacts, which will go into the barn. And I'll show you that picture at the end. But these are some of the uh, signs from town, which have uh, they are among our largest artifacts, which will be um, replay, replaced in the barn. The one that we're most concerned about is this H Shepherd sign. And if you just look on the right-hand side, you can see where there is damage. But these signs were all used in downtown Northampton. And this particular shepherd sign, you can see it right here, between the uh, years of 
1873 and 75 hung on uh, Shepherd's, uh, I mean, on Pleasant Street, where there the Shepherds had a grocery. Now it's especially significant to us because it is the Shepherd Barn. So this was the, uh, the downtown shop that they had. Now, if you look more closely at what's happened to the sign over the time, the S-H-E-P-H are in good shape, but over at the right-hand side, there's um, great damage. And it's not quite clear, you know, how this was created over time, but it's been there for quite a long period of time. And what the what we want to do is have a conservator work on it to uh, put it back to a situation where it will be good to look at and will be stabilized uh, in the barn. So we had um, bids from two conservators. I, I should say too that it's very long; it's 13 feet long. And in fact, most of these signs are, well, they're, you know, up to 15, 20 feet long, and there's not a lot of people who, who can work on them. So this particular one, um, several conservators could not work on it because their studio wasn't large enough. But what needs to happen here is that the paint that's flaking off needs to be reapplied with adhesive, you know, set back down onto the, um, the wooden surface. And then um, they will do some in painting and then probably create a kind of seal over it so that from a distance it's it's all going to look, um, you know, uh, smooth. You're going to see it. Uh, you're not going to see this this level of damage. Um, so that's uh, that particular sign. And this is expensive to do. But we have a, a great deal of other ones. Now, I should say that a lot of these artifacts, some of them can get damaged over time, not being stored in proper conditions, but some of them get damaged just by it, the inherent nature of how they're constructed and the materials that they're used. I mean, through no fault of anyone's own, they, they decompose, they um, can be damaged. So I wanted to use this Daily Hampshire Gazette sign. It again is rather large. It's probably three feet by four feet. And what I was concerned with is how you can see on the background here, the paint, um, let's see, I have a close up of that, yeah. It looks, uh, all these, um, the background paint has sand in it and the sand is used to kind of, um, creates a kind of, uh, you can, can see more um, the light play on it. It has a rougher surface. It's a better visual sign and it makes it very durable. But over time, what's happened here is that the sand has bleached um, and the conservator, uh, Mark Williams, came up to Historic Northampton and spent a full day with us going through all of these individual signs and explained to me that what's what's happening here is that the the sand looks like it's popping up or looking bleached because the black um, subsurface is settling down. So. But my point is that in order to clean and repair some of these, you really need to know exactly, technically speaking, what's what's going wrong with them. So, but a number of the other signs that we have in the collection, which can go in the barn, are in decent condition. So this top one is the second one, the burgers, needs to be cleaned, but it's really important to understand the proper technique for cleaning it. And then there's just some other fun ones that we'll just clean and we won't worry about doing any kind of conservation with them. Um, a, a final thing that we're concerned with is, whoops, is on this one, um, this is one of the horse stalls in the barn and you can see the name of the horse is Brer Fox is the name of the horse and that's above this particular stall window. And we wanna be able to stabilize that. So this is whitewash, so it's not a danger to anybody and we'll be working on how to um, get the whitewash stabilized so it doesn't, you know, flake off um, into the, uh, you know, onto people's hands. So this is the barn itself and it really looks uh, very much like this today. And this is Br'er Fox right there. And then this is um, his son on his horse. They were great horse people. And what they had done is taken this barn and turned it into a horse, horse barn. So that's exactly what it is today. So, so these things will be worked on in the museum itself. We're thinking that we can, if we can do this like in February, it would be great to be able to close to the public and use our main gallery um, as a kind of uh, conservator's workshop where we bring all the signs out. One of the difficulties is these are really big. So it's, it's good to be able to treat them on site.
The other piece to it that I'm kind of excited about is the conservator, Mark Williams, who will be working with a couple of our staff members. And so we will gain some of that knowledge of how to do some of the the less technical professional treatments. So for example, some of the cleaning, so some of them might have be cleaning, you use very small types of um, vacuum cleaners and brushes and swabs and um, uh, distilled water, some of their main tools. And so to learn how to do some of those techniques with that conservator itself, I think will be great for us. So that's um, the gist of it. And I'm gonna show, go back up here I'm sorry, this is sideways, and then I can switch it so you could see. So this is where, how they will be um, uh, exhibited in the barn. So they'll be sort of hung from the raft, some of the rafters or hung um, on the sides of the barn. And the idea is for the central space of the barn to be left open for performance and visitors and things like that. So that's what I said, it's a very discreet um, project. And Lori, do you want to just explain how that works into the timetable? Well, well, this, yeah, this is a piece that in order, our hope is that um, all of the construction phase, which just as a quick backdrop for if, um, I know you received this proposal more than a month ago, but in terms of the details of our timetable, we had applied to for funding in the fall of 2019 and were awarded uh, support from the CPA for the barn project of uh, $170,000. And at that point we were on this like full speed ahead. Um, we're gonna make the essential repairs that need to occur so that we can get the public back in. But as we all well know, uh, we ran into the pandemic, which ha had in our case, slowed the pro process down just as you were mentioning in terms of uh, the, the last potential project uh, that you're reviewing. And it, through uh, consultants that we had through other grants, uh, hiring Jack Sobin, it became clear to us, especially also talking with the building inspector, that in order to really do the project right in terms of uh, uh, the most efficient use of uh, CPA dollars, donor dollars, et cetera, our efficiency as an organization and really the, the best for preservation and restoration. Um, we applied to you again for some technical support. We received funding from you for that. We also received a grant um, of $25,000 from the Massachusetts Cultural Council. So anyway, we're now at this stage where all these pieces are coming together. And now in order to, if if everything comes together just the way we're hoping and um, where we're really at this uh, design and planning feasibility point, that this piece of making sure that the artifacts that we're going to reinstall are, are ready for next fall, this, this is the timing. It's that, you know, nine or ten months ahead of time uh, to ensure that these are properly restored um and professionally restored that that that's why we've come to you for this for this piece and and uh just in terms of the i'm not sure if you have the proposal right there in front of you but it, the total project cost for this is forty two thousand dollars of which we're asking for 75 percent, which is about thirty thousand dollars from from the cpa So uh, we welcome any any questions, comments, feedback uh, from any of you. Great, thank you, Lori. And uh, I think I said Betsy. It's it's Betty, right? Yes. Betty. Yes. yes. All right. That's My right. apologies. That's um, right. Questions for Lori and Betty. Linda. You're muted, Linda. I'm sorry, I took my finger off the button. <laughs> um, th this is this is more about the future, and I know you did respond with um, to the question, anticipating coming back to us for funding. Would that be um, in the spring round? Is that what you're looking at? 
We're looking at no the the wind. Well, what would I don't know what you call well, spring. Well, uh, the next round. Let's, let's, the whatever, next round. Yes. Whenever it next is, yeah. The next round. Uh, by at um, our contractor who who will be doing the interior demolition work, which um, we went with a preservation expert, Eric Radoya, who some of you may know from Historic Deerfield, and Sharon Merman, who coordinated the. Uh, removal, recording, et cetera, of all 625 items. Um, and with our architect went through and identified the areas that would be uh, preserved and, and moved, and then those interior elements that will be uh, removed. And so um, our contractor went to the building inspector today for that permit, and um, within two weeks, the interior demolition exploratory, we can call it, a reveal will be done of removing the floor, et cetera. And at that point, that's when the, the last, sort of the last piece for the barn, the structural engineers will be able to really see in detail all the, the element, the, you know, the, the bare bones will be revealed so we can finally get those final stamp plans. And that's, that's really among the last <laughs> uh, discovery phase that, that we have um, I suppose the other the other piece will be then you know we'll be hiring an archaeologist to come in and to do a site survey to ensure that um, you know we're working in a discreet way and trying to protect as much as possible. And as you, this property is under a preservation restriction uh, with the city, um, but that is a permit that will be the the field investigation permit comes from the Massachusetts Historical Commission for the archaeologist to do that work which Linda, you know perhaps better than anyone else on this committee, but maybe <laughs> maybe many others are familiar with that process too, so. Other questions? Nobody? We are good to go on this? Yes? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and again, thank you. thank you so much for hanging in there through the uh, bulk of this of this meeting. You're welcome uh, to continue or to check out. And once again, uh, on the 3rd of November is the public comment. So it can be both written as well as folks uh, live zooming in. And we encourage your supporters to participate if, if they see fit. Uh, so thanks again. Um, from pickleball to disabled homeless to barn restoration. And now finally back to Michelson uh, galleries uh, for a resubmission of the, of the, of the summer proposal. Um, so Paul and Richard, again, thank you for hanging in there for, for a couple hours. Sure. Thanks for having us. Um, Many of many of you have 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 heard this, so so please bear with me if I'm telling you things that you've already heard. Uh, I do have some some pictures, if I can share my screen, just to sort of go through um, go through what the proposal is and and um, and what we're what we're asking for, um, if that's okay. Okay, so here's the front of here's the front of our building, and mainly the area is, is we've got this sort of capital up top, where it says Northampton National Bank. As in our proposal, the building was built in 1913. Um, it was done by uh, it was a third incarnation of the bank. Um, it was it was done by. Uh, Hutchins and French, who were known for doing uh, schools and banks all over New England, many of which are historic or uh, on the historic register now. So mainly up in this area here, you know, is behind the tree, things are not, uh, the water's not evaporating um, the same way it is the rest of the building and you're getting water seeping in and you can see um, here where some of the uh, some of the lettering here is starting to erode. Um, 
the this is the the back of it. You can see it's just a freestanding, uh, just a freestanding uh, area here. Um, uh, otherwise, it would just be a flat roof. And so, the 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 water is coming in through some of these areas here, and you're starting to get the limestone blocks are starting to shift. Um, we've had several masons look at it. Uh, we had one quote, we've gotten two more quotes since our proposal. Um, you know, it, we, we've been hounding down the, uh, the masons as best we can. Um, uh, during COVID, everybody is sort of stretched um, and I can share those quotes with you as well. Um, and so what basically what needs to happen is that these large limestone blocks need to be removed. The underlying masonry structure uh, needs to be assessed and pop possibly rebuilt. And then the, the blocks need to be put back on and repointed and, and, and sealed up. Um, here's some close-ups of the of the lettering here and you can see where they've it started to crack and some of the lettering has sort of has sort of come off. And this is where when it when it first started, we started to get some of this coming down into the sidewalk. Um, so, and that, that started this, this whole uh, project. Um, this here, you can see where it, it's hard to see in the front area where we don't take many pictures of the front with the, with the leaves there because you, because you can't see the front of the building. But when this is all full, it just casts a lot of shade on, on the building. Um, we've gotten several quotes uh, to, to remove it and rebuild it. Um, we don't know exactly what's inside because they need to take the, the limestone blocks out. So each mason has sort of estimated their best guess at what needs to be done uh, when we get inside. And the, the quotes range from 175.5, which is the one that was in the proposal. Uh, we got another one for 172 and one recently for 228. Um, there is an option to just remove the entire area. If we have to take it off instead of rebuilding it, it just gets removed entirely and then just sealed over and roofed over. And the estimate would be about half the price to be able to, to do that. Um, and that would just be removing just this whole area right here and it would just be sealed up and, and, and sealed over. We would like to restore it. We think it's it's a high visibility area. It's a national register. It's in the downtown historic business district. Um, we, we did meet with the historical commission early this year and they did deem it historically significant enough to warrant, um, to warrant preservation. You know, they, they made their recommendation to the committee for that. Um, and so, you know, at, at this point, we would like to be able to restore it. it. It serves no purpose to our business except for housing the business. Um, it is, you know, it is highly visible to the street and we think it's one of the most highly visible of the historic buildings in town. Um, so we are asking for the funds to preserve this area um, both for preserving the heritage, but also just for safety reasons as well. Um, I think over the winter, we had, we had wanted to be able to do this before the winter for safety reasons. Uh, I think over the winter, we're gonna have to put some scaffolding, a protective scaffolding over the sidewalk with a protective top. Um, once it starts getting cold, we start to get into some, uh, some risk, you know, as things expand and contract to be able to, um, you know, just make sure people don't get hurt. But, and we've talked to some scaffolding companies to do that, you know, when, once it starts getting cold. Some of the Masons uh, have said they couldn't work till spring. We did have one that said they could do it sooner, you know, weather dependent, but, um, you know, anything more serious, we'd have to make sure that we had funding to be able to, you know, in good conscience enlist their um, it enlist their services, you know, uh, to get more specific at that point to tie up their time. So, um, are there any questions uh, about what we need done or 
what the what the job is? Uh, questions, uh, questions for Paul or Richard? I'm not seeing it. Uh, uh, Linda. Yeah, I apologize. I was not able to um, make the the last meeting that uh, you presented at. So this this is ground that may have been covered. Um, but it's 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 obviously a, a different situation for us. I think um, this I know was raised with you that this is a, a private business. So I think we really do need to understand why it's necessary for you to come asking for the citizens of Northampton to be supporting this um, and to be sure that that's not something you can undertake yourself. Mm -hmm. You responded to a question saying that you had had a mortgage and that it was paid off through a, a, a lot of hard effort. Um, but from what I could see, that was paid off like the end of 99, beginning of 2000. So this has been a property that's, I may be mistaken, so correct me please if I'm wrong. It, it seems to be a property that's been operating without a mortgage for, for well over 20, 20 years. And I, um, you know, it's, it's awkward for us to ask you to reveal your finances, but I, I don't feel like I've gotten um, something that I really can get my teeth into to, to say, no, they really can't do it. It's really necessary for public dollars to be used to preserve this. I absolutely agree. It's a it's a it's a key building, and it would dramatically change the the viewscape and be a real detriment to the city if if that had to be lopped off. Um, but but I need to understand why tax tax dollars need to support this, and I and I don't have enough to feel I to feel that I know that one way or the other at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul, can you unshare your screen just so at, at least I can see all the committee members? Is that possible? Great. That's helpful. Thank you. Sure. I think so. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, we are in a double whammy of coming two years off of uh, COVID, um, where before I generally had three people working the floor at all times. Uh, dealing with people coming in and uh, et cetera. Um, now we have those same three people all sitting at their desks because nobody's downtown. Um, and uh, so this is coming at a particularly difficult time uh, just when, um, you know, and we just are not seeing uh, things rebounding yet. Um, and uh, um, and I apologize because Paul just found out just today that um, and, and that we could take the just top off for about half that, um, which I hate to do. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, I just um, came out of surgery for this. So um, I haven't had a chance really to talk to Paul uh, uh, before this. And I didn't want to get off in the hours we were waiting in case uh, you came to us. So. Um, uh, it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that because of where we are, we have to um, build that facade. Uh, if we don't, um, you know, it would be a shame, but at this point with um, where things are now, um, I think, you know, that would probably be our option uh, for now. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a big nut to pay um, to keep. You know, after forty years, we have a lot of our clients. Um, you know, I do think we could run a successful business uh, elsewhere and not have to have the expenses of keeping this uh, up, which are tremendous. Um, but I think uh, if there's any way we can both keep the facade and keep the business. Uh, downtown, uh, I would love to do that. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I mean, again, we talked about 
uh, opening up the books. Um, I had a sense when you, when we spoke last time, that that was nothing you necessarily wanted to pursue. And if it is something that has to that you want to pursue, uh, I do feel I, you know, I mean, we are supporting about 200 local artists, uh, 50 of them about it's their sole income. And I would want to, before I, um, you know, uh, before I let uh, everybody know what all the local artists are making, I would, I would want to talk to them uh, all and, and go that route. Um, but can somebody answer your question? Am I allowed to just take that uh, facade off? I was told that I was not. Well, Paul, can you answer that? Could you talk to the town about that? I, I, I was told that, that though there are no hard and fast restrictions, um, although we would need to consult with, um, we, we would need to consult with people before we did it. But, but I think it was Martha who in the last meeting said that we were not prohibited from doing that. It was, there was no prohibition from us um, doing anything to the building. So the, the, the listing on the National Register of Historic Places doesn't preclude any architectural changes to the building, mm -hmm. but because it's located within the Central Business District, it wouldn't need review by the Central Business Architecture Committee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if in fact you went that removal route, Paul and Richard, that would not be restoration and available for CPC funds, is that correct? It would simply be a removal mm -hmm. and not and that would be well that that is that is my understanding is that is you know you know we would you know we we don't know what the finances of that would look like but a you know a a, a, a hundred thousand dollar problem might be more reachable than a two hundred thousand dollar problem you know um so we, we that we have to put that out as one of our options. If if we if we cannot afford to restore it, um, you know, we'll have to look at what options we can to either keep the building or just even make it safe. And and that may end up being an option. That's um, you know, as as we spoke before, you know, we have you know a certain amount of money that we've been able to sort of raise for this, you know, which I think is something in the in the neighborhood of about twenty thousand. Um, you know, we're, we're a little nervous because every Mason that we've spoken to, and you can see there's a, a range of about, I don't know, 40 or 50,000 or so between, you know, that's their guessing of what the masonry looks like inside and how much they feel they're going to have to rebuild it. Um, but all of them have said, well, if we're just taking it off and not putting it back on, you know, you're, you're about half the cost. So. Um, but yes, no, I understand that it would not be covered by CPA funds if the, if we decided to remove it and not replace it. Thank you. Other questions for Paul and Richard? Linda? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I, I feel like I'm still not quite getting enough of an answer on this. Have you, have you talked uh, with a bank about what kind of a mortgage you could get? Is it and if it's $2,000 a month or something, is that really not something that the business can support? No, well, I mean, um, you know, that's, that's uh, like people who come in and say, well, um, this piece is $500, would you not sell it for 490 and 480 and you can keep going like that. Um, you know, there is a point that it's just not um, worth it. Um, you know, the amount of upkeep on the building is um, is something we deal with every day. Um, right now, we're replacing what a back area roof, um, you know, because this is an old building uh, that's going to be somewhere around $40,000. Um, there's, uh, because we're starting this later than we had originally anticipated, um, we just, I, Paul just got a scaffolding quote, which is going to have to go up. And what is that, Paul? I don't even know. Um, we have, um, you know, it, it, it's somewhere in the nature of about 
between six and ten thousand, depending on the the quote. But then there's uh, you know monthly monthly rentals, um, which usually run about you know forty dollars a day or so, um, which we may have to have up until the end of the winter or something can begin. You know, as, as far as work can begin, we would build off the protective scaffolding once work can begin. But it would be up for several months. Right. So I mean, we keep adding these um, these fees, and um, you know, uh, while I love the facade, um, I'm just you know, and uh, it's a centerpiece in downtown. Um, we're coming off of two years of difficulty, uh, where we've kept uh, tried to keep our artists. Uh, paid and our staff paid, and uh, it's starting to, uh, we're starting to feel um, with our back against the wall. I mean, I'm happy to, uh, uh, you know, and, and at some point, um, I look at this and say, well, if we can, you know, shave off 100,000, 120,000, um, at, you know, uh, honestly, I would not have come to you five years ago. Um, but it's a different ball game now. And I think that what we're asking for is, um, is for the central, you know, a great facade right in the central downtown that people will dearly miss. Um, and, uh, and, and frankly, I'm also, I'll be surprised if we do get permission to just level the roof, but I guess that's the next step. Um, and if, if we, you know, um, uh, you know, if, if we're not getting money to restore it, then, you know, that's where we go. I, I don't know how the other committee members feel. And again, I apologize. I was, that I was not at, at your last presentation. Um, but I don't see any reason why you have to reveal what is paid to artists. What you, you're a you're a business, mm -hmm. um, and uh, providing information about the profitability or lack thereof of your business uh, is is something that I think I would need to see in order to feel that right. it was a pro decide whether it was appropriate to spend these these dollars that way. And I right. don't think that would need involve any any of the artists or inv invade their privacy or their personal business. Yeah, I was of the impression the last meeting that that was an avenue you did not want to go down. Yeah, I, again, I was not there, and I, so I apologize for that. And I don't know how other committee members feel, so I actually would like to hear from the other committee members. All right, and I and I would you know I would would have probably invited my accountant and lawyer to this call, and we can do that next time. So Linda, we did discuss that in some detail. And our I, I think the feeling of the group at that time in the summer was that we are not, uh, uh, and I'll speak for myself, but I think other people were saying the same, have that expertise to look at a uh, the finances of a business and be able to judge its profitability uh, or not. There are so many uh, convoluted factors that go into a business and for us to uh, for, for us to be able to take a look at that and, and make, make an understanding of that, I think is, uh, uh, was, was deemed too much of a challenge uh, for us. Um, am, am I speaking for the group in that, in that way? I think that's, that was the discussion that we had. Martha, you wanted to say something? about that well, i would just say that i was so funny brought it up at the last meeting just what linda's saying and i think it's um because many many years ago i um, was a grant program officer for the state and we always asked for financials when we were giving public money to any kind of a um organization a nonprofit organization i mean you have to be um you know careful that your the public dollars are being responsibly spent and the public investment is being safeguarded and that's one of the ways it's done now i can i think if this committee doesn't feel like they have the qualifications to do that then i think we have to question whether we should be entertaining applications like this 
Um, you know, we do when we are getting applications for public housing development, um, we do ask for a lot of financial information. It's always provided. Um, so I, I just I just throw that out there. And I will just say also that I did bring this up with the historical commission at our September meeting just to kind of get a reading from the rest of the commissioners about this. And there was a, certainly a lot of support for um, applications for historic preservation. Um, but there was, I think, unanimous feeling that, um, you know, the city's, the taxpayer's investment has to be protected in some way. So th through a preservation restriction or some type of um, measure that would assure protection and responsible use of public dollars. Are you referring to the use of the building henceforth? I know you had asked questions about whether it would be open and available for certain events, or, or is that is that what you're referring to? Uh, preservation restriction usually applies to um, you know physical work that's done in the building. It protects the physical structure itself. Unless I'm, yeah. I, I would ask Sarah to correct me if I'm wrong about that. But typically yeah, like, uh, like Lori Sanders had mentioned with regard to the Shepherd Barn that Historic Northampton is protected by a historic preservation restriction. And that was the result of CPA funding. Right, some right, right. So every architectural change there does require review and approval by the city. Right. Um, and a few people had asked, so I did check with the city solicitor regarding this issue just because it hasn't come up before. And he opined that if the committee felt that this building, it, that it was in the public interest to protect this element of the building, that a CPA grant in exchange for a historic preservation restriction would not violate the anti-aid amendment in that case. Um, and it would be a pur and purchase of an interest in real estate. And as long as the city doesn't grant more than the fair market value of the historic preservation restriction, then that shouldn't be a violation. Um, and he also indicated that he'd never been involved in a CPA funded project that didn't involve a preservation restriction being contained. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, but that likely would have some impact on the, the value of the structure going forward. And that's something that you might want to look at separately. Mm -hmm. Well, that, was that, is some, that is something you would uh, agree with Paul and Richard to have a preservation restriction placed on the building in exchange for public dollars? Yes. No. Yes, yes. I think we we spoke about that last um, uh, last time, and I think it was also one of the questions that was posed to us. That yes, we would be uh, we would be open to that, um, and uh, and I think there was also some talk about a possibility of reimbursement of the CPA funds when the building was eventually sold that um, from sale of the building, that that would also be something that could be arranged, that, that whatever funds the CPA provided would be, would be given back to once the building was sold. Right. Well, you asked if uh, what happens if you give the money and then we sell the building anyways. Uh, and the answer was, that's not our intention. And so therefore uh, we'd be happy to say if the building sold within whatever time frame you think is appropriate, um, the money would just be reimbursed. You know, I mean, our intention is to keep the business, you know, we've been here over 40 years. Um, I've about run my um, uh, race, uh, but, um, you know, most of the staff has been here for between uh, 15 and I think in Paul's mm -hmm. case, 35 years. Uh, and they have the full intention of keeping it running for another 40, so. So just um, to follow up on that, Rich, um, I, I guess I don't really understand if, if that's an option for you to pay the uh, money back, you know, if you sell it or what, is that really a, that much different from a bank loan? I mean, isn't that what you usually do with a bank loan? You know, when you sell the building, you end up paying it back? No, I mean, it's different in that, uh, first of all, uh, you had brought up, uh, you know, a certain time frame. Second of all, there's no intention of selling the building at this moment. Um, and third of all, um, we have the money up front and we're not paying a monthly on it. Um, we're not paying anything until um, 
until the building is sold, if it's sold. So it's less expensive than a bank loan. It's less expensive than a bank loan, yes. And and there and the outlay up front is totally different. You know, is different. Jen. Thank you. Um, do so. I have two questions, maybe for Sarah. Um, are his what is the term of a historic preservation restriction? Is it in perpetuity? And um, are there available comps for the valuation of whatever the public good is in, you know, are there are there comps for the valuation of a historic preservation restriction? Because to me, that seems like a set, a different application, I guess, is to sell a historic preservation restriction like through CPA funding rather than um, specifically applying for this specific repair. Does that make sense? So it would be accessing funding, but for a different purpose that could then be spent in whatever way. You're muted. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, we've never had to appraise the value of a historic preservation restriction because it's usually something that, that's provided as a matter of course in exchange for CPA funding for a particular project, be it acquisition of a historic property where it's actually required or a project like Historic Northampton where I think the initial dollar investment was pretty small, um, but they're, you know, the organization's mission is essentially to provide historic education and provision of that historic preservation restriction will be an issue. Um, you know, I, so I, I don't know what the exact value of the preservation restriction would be. We could potentially look into that with an appraiser. Um, it, it's, I don't think it would be likely that the, the value would exceed the CPA grant in this case. But it, it could be lower potentially. I just have no sense of if this is, it seemed from our last meeting discussing this, that this isn't really a working model in historic preservation as it is in conservation, which I'm much more familiar with, um, where sort of the public benefit and the private benefit are separate, or like the values are able to be separated through conservation restrictions or agricultural restrictions. Um, so I just wasn't sure if there, I mean, if, if we've never done it locally, it seems like it would be hard to find an appraiser that knew. Yeah, that. and it, it's definitely a little bit nebulous, you know, yeah. to depending on the buyer, a building with a preservation restriction might be worth more or right. it, it might be worth less. And because of its presence within the central business architecture, architecture district, some of these restrictions are sort of already in place, but not in perpetuity. Right. So it, it's hard to say what the exact value. Okay, that's helpful. And is is a restrict a historic preservation restriction in perpetuity? It is. Okay. Thank you. So one thing I'm hearing, Paul and Rich, is that uh, if we were to publicly fund this, we could we would put conditions on that funding. One would be to. Uh, uh, have a historic preservation restriction placed on the building in perpetuity. Another would be some sort of uh, either reimbursement once the building is sold or, or within a certain time period, uh, if the building was sold. The third perhaps would be to uh, have assurance that there would be continued uh, provision of the building for public, uh, public use in terms of um, the way that you've been so generously doing that in the past. Those are all, those three conditions, if I'm reading it right, would be acceptable to, to you? Yes, I, I'm, I'm assuming that the historic preservations apply mainly to the front facing facade. I, I think I asked this question at the last meeting. So, so if I need to do something to the interior of the building, or, or, or the basement or something that doesn't come under that historic restriction. So yeah. it, it, it would apply to the building as a whole, um, but there are certain activities that are spelled out as minor, uh, 
certain types of repairs, you know, right. a lot of things that our interior would qualify as a as a minor activity right. wouldn't need any review. Right. But it does apply to the entire building. Okay, because I know like the back part of the building was built in the 1950s. You know, I mean the the the, the whole back section uh, of the building. Um, we've repurposed some of the areas there. So I, I guess I guess I I I'm sure whatever whatever would need to happen could happen. I guess, but I assume that that would all be sort of specified and laid out what we could and couldn't do. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even if you were proposing something that would need review, if that activity wouldn't impact the historic integrity of the building, right? Then it it would be allowed. It, you would just have to go through a review process. Right, right. So, so, so if I'm repainting a room, I don't need to go. I don't need to go through a committee to do that. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. I know we had gone through this once before. We wanted to put a um, a display case in the front of the building where our windows are because they're set back. And we ran into uh, we we ran into a situation where we could only put like a big glass case up. You know, instead we couldn't have put some. We couldn't even put a stone a stone case up, um, and it just seemed odd because it it just it didn't seem to fit with the 1913 vibe. But so we and we just abandoned the project. But um, but so I just wanted to make sure it just really just sort of the what would be covered and what wouldn't. So that um, if I if I need to make repairs or I need to paint something, um, it doesn't take six months to do that. You know, I can still run my business. You know. Yeah, I mean, basically, you would be required to um, do work that complies with the secretaries of. Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties, mm -hmm. with the exception of minor activities like painting okay. interior rooms. So, so I think Paul and Rich, Sarah could provide you with that, with that documentation, so you would know before entering into this contract what, what was and was not prohibited under a historic preservation. That, that would be great. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure it will be fine. I just, it, it, it would be good to have that documentation. Including the, the Secretary of the Interior Standards, that would be important for you to look at. Mm -hmm. So, Sarah, Sarah, can you get that to Paul and Rich and yeah, or, or Martha right. uh, in the next few days? That would, that would be helpful. Um, other questions? Jana? Again, partially a question for Sarah, but around the third potential restriction that's been discussed relative to maintaining public access. I'm wondering how, uh, what mechanism exists for, for that? Is there a known mechanism? How would we, how would we uh, apply that as a condition? Uh, that one would be a little bit different. That would have to just be a contract, a, a condition of the contract. Um, but I, the details of that would need to be something that would be worked out. But it so, is conceptually something we could do. Yeah, um, you know, as long as it's something that the committee agrees to and the and the applicant agrees to, and it's something that makes sense going forward, that could definitely be included as a contract condition. But it, there's re, there's really no template to include that in a in a permanent mechanism. Okay, I mean, it seems to me like the 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 um, I mean, what we would be doing with the preservation restriction is, is trying to actually, you know, translate the tax dollars into a, a material public good. And I think the public access could, in theory, do the same thing, but what that could mean all kinds of different things in practice. So to me, I think we would need to think through as a committee carefully what that mm -hmm. expectation actually was and what the nature of that agreement would be um, to make sure that it was suitable for the applicants, but also to make sure that it was really meeting the, uh, the spirit and intention of, of um, you know, appropriate use of, uh, as mm -hmm. somebody put it earlier, stewardship of public funds. So not necessarily saying I'm not for it. It just, I, that feels to me like it needs more thought since it is, there isn't a template for it, as you said. Uh, Sarah, is that something you could work on perhaps is what language we could entertain to put that as a condition? Uh, yeah. Great. Um, 
I, I'd like to get back to Linda's issue. And again, this came up, Linda, in, this, in the summer uh, when we were discussing uh, over the, the uh, sort of looking at a private or, or looking at the books of a private business to ascertain financial viability and whether or not they could, they could be doing this on, on their own. And I'm curious how other people feel about this. Again, my recollection of the summer meeting was that we, we were punting on that to be footballish about it uh, and, and not feeling that, um, that, our, that we had the qualifications to entertain such a thing. But now I'm hearing from Martha and perhaps from Linda otherwise. So can we, uh, can we have a, other people weigh in on that? Uh, Dan? Yeah, I, I would definitely be concerned about applying more burdensome uh, conditions on an applicant uh, than we have uh, historically. I, you know, before my time on the commission, I see in the history that, that CPA funds went to the marquee of the Academy of Music. So I, I think taking a look at, at similar projects that have a you know, a, a public purpose that are you know, historic assets that are you know, kind of external like, like, like this, uh, you know, a facade or a marquee, you know, something like that. I, I wonder if, if Sarah could point us to a, a model where, you know, so we don't, so we're, we're consistent and we don't, we don't be, we're not too burdensome on an applicant. Uh, this one's just a little bit different because it's a for-profit business. Um, you know, the Academy of Music is owned by the city. Yeah. So, so that's a different sort of scenario than, than but, this would. But Sarah, uh, the, just the, the Community Preservation Act doesn't prohibit use of CPA funds uh, for projects on privately owned property, correct? It does not. No, the, the committee would just have to find that um, there's a clear public interest. Yeah. Other folks want to weigh in on this? Uh, um, Chris? Pretty sure I was one of the ones who fell down on the on the um, <clears throat> the side of um, not being competent to review documents of that type um, in any meaningful way. Um, I was struck by something that Martha said earlier about when you were doing reviews previously, Martha. And I'm trying to remember how you phrased it, but. Um, it seemed to me that the type of organization that you were, I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at in my very roundabout way here is that I'm trying to draw a line of difference between um, the fiscal operations of a private entity and um, the, 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 the fiscal operations of um, a not-for-profit or um, a, a government entity where by virtue of their status, their, their records deserve a different level of scrutiny. I think there's proprietary information with regard to private, you know, to totally private entities that I'm not entirely sure I'm comfortable investigating and certainly I'm not competent to. Um, so I guess I've got two levels of concern there. One is, is it appropriate for us to be looking at, at that kind of material from, from private entity? And the second is my ability as an individual to, to just glean anything meaningful from it, regardless of where the, where the information is coming from. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, Julia? I was holding my head, not holding up my hand, but, uh, you know, I... Um... I don't feel incompetent to look at the at, at, at any of the financial records. I mean, I look at financial records for other institutions for stuff I do regularly. I, I just, I'm still trying to weigh how, how, how we, I understand the public good, but how we manage this against the way we manage or help assign money to all of the nonprofits that that we're that we've been dealing with. So, you know, if we looked at the books and the assets of this instant of this of this gallery, we would have no understanding of their 
future potential. And so if they end up in a year with lots of revenue, and now we've put the public money in to uh, fix the, to, you know, to do the work on the building that ultimately they could have, have, have managed themselves, uh, was that in the best interest of the public? And that contrasts to me really in a large way against some of the groups that come to us who have no assets and have no potential to build revenue from for, uh, or, or profits through their business model. So uh, I'm, I'm struggling. I could look at the books, but is that really what I wanna do? My, you know, it, but, but again, the gallery exists to generate revenue and build a profit for the person who owns the gallery. There'll be a profit one day. I'm assuming that's what we'd see on the books. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how I'm playing out. Thank you, Julia. Jen? I'm not sure if I ha have a question actually. I, and I don't think, or we're not discussing, are we discussing right now or no? No, we're simply trying to frame if, there, if we need additional information from Paul and Rich okay. for us to move forward. I mean, I think that was my intent. So in I guess I do have again. a question then, just with people that have more expertise than I do in the world of historic preservation, um, coming again, I think I explained last time, but just coming from the world of conservation, I'm very used to this idea of separating public good and private ownership. And that is how a lot of conservation happens. And it's irrelevant what the landowner does with the money because there's a public good established by putting a conservation or agricultural restriction on the property. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to wrap my head around is if there is a public good here and it does have value, what is the difference if it's owned by a nonprofit or a for-profit? Like if we're funding the public good and not the organization, like is that, I don't know, I, that's how I think of it in conservation terms, but I am not as familiar with, so I'm just trying to understand that. That would help me understand if I need more information, I guess. I just wanna say, I, I, I really like the way you framed that, thank you. Yeah, and Jen, I think that I make, you make a really good point about that. And I think that um, <sighs> there's um, certainly that approach of, is really valid. You know, we have thousands of historic buildings in Northampton. Um, there are many, many, many more in the downtown um, that probably all need to have worked on them. And so I'm just... I'm just raising, um, and I think this kind of go back to the beginning of this discussion way back in the summer is, um, you know, if you, um, you know, launch this effort, um, then what, you know, how do we stay, how do we say no to future applicants and, and what are the, you know, can we say no to future applicants? It could drain all of the CPA funding and you know, how do you make a decision? Um, and just to answer your question about um, uh, preservation dollars, public preservation dollars for private entities, those are um, awarded and they're done through tax credits. That's typically how it's done. So, but we don't have a program like that in Northampton. Uh, Jeff, you haven't weighed in on this. Is there something you'd like to say? I don't, I don't feel the need to see the financial records. Um, I don't, I mean, like several people have said earlier, I don't know that that would sway me one way or the other. I think that, I think the crucial question is the, is the public good served um, by preserving the building or not? I'm struck, <clears throat> I'm struck by um, the comparison of what we heard earlier tonight with regard to housing where, hey, we got to get this up and running yesterday. We, we got to go. And with this particular project, um, there, is a, there is a direct urgency that's been, was spelled out over the summer. 
was spelled out again tonight about the deterioration of the building. And yet <clears throat> um, we seem to we seem to want <clears throat> to revisit delaying and and restudy the issue. And I think um, pondering going through financial records isn't going to really do anything <clears throat> uh, to me um, in um, changing my opinion that I expressed over the summer. So. Um, and as far as for-profit corporations and nonprofits, um, <clears throat> from a labor movement perspective, which is what I do, there is very little difference. They just um, organize their financial ledgers a little bit differently, <clears throat> but they're still out to basically do the same thing. So to me, it comes down to um, is the public good served by preserving this building or not? I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jana? Uh, to reiterate what I said in the summer and what others have said here, I don't feel like seeing the books would help me more. I think our charge is to, as Sarah pointed out, to have a positive finding that this would serve the public good. And not a finding of whether or not this particular organization can or can't afford, um, in our estimation, cannot or can afford this particular project. Um, I don't think that looking at the books would reveal that. I think it's probably a matter of some opinion as we've already heard from the applicants themselves. Um, just because the money may or may not be sitting there doesn't mean that they're gonna choose to allocate it in that way. So I think that's gonna take us down uh, another rabbit hole that doesn't ultimately lead us toward what should be at the heart of our decision of whether this serves the public good. So I do not feel like I want to see um, this business's books as part of this decision-making process. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, Dan, did you weigh in on this already? I think you may have started. I just agree with, with Jenna and Jeff's comments. Don't, don't need to see the records for you know, we're talking about the exterior of, of the, the building where there's a, an immediate uh, risk to, to public safety uh, over a public sidewalk. You know, I, it sounds like the, you know, the ac access for the public to the gallery community meetings is a plus, but not required uh, for, for a project like this, if, if I'm understanding it correctly. Uh, thank you, Dan. Circling back to Linda, uh, you wanna comment? Uh, no, I think I'll, uh, this is going to start getting into the, the, the merits. Um, it, it seems like this, the sentiment is to not require the finances. Um, so they will not be required. And I'll make my comments when we discuss it. Great. Thank you, Linda. Um, uh, other comments or questions for Paul and Rich? Are we good to go on this? I guess uh, I, I guess I, having said what I just said, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. <laughs> um, there's obviously a public good here, um, but there's lots of public goods that we could be funding and it's, and it's, we have to choose which ones to fund. Um, and to me, knowing that the dollars are necessary to create that public good or to secure that public good um, is, is a critical piece. So I guess I would ask if it's not the finances, is there anything else that the applicants can provide that would convince us other than your statement that you'll sell the building or, or try to knock down the facade that this will be lost if you don't get this money? I mean, you've, you've said you want to maintain the building, you want to maintain the business in the building, but if we don't give you this money, you're going to sell it. Well, I'm probably, we're going to look seriously about putting on the roof right now because my priority right now, as much as I want to save the building, is keeping my artists, um, getting them through this time. 
and uh, and just as you have to choose where you want to spend your money, um, I have to choose where I want to spend the money, and I come down on on uh, keeping my artists um, through this time. I mean, I, I guess that's the bottom so line. So you, you're saying that if you don't get this money, you will sell the building? I Is will. Is that what you're saying? Either that or, uh, or I just found out today myself um, that uh, um, one of the roofers said he could uh, just remove that top um, and that would save us over $100,000. Um, so that is probably where I would look for next. But um, obviously, Paul and I need to sit and talk about that. Thanks. Brian, I think maybe you tried to call me, but you're muted, so. I, I did. Thank you. Yes. Jen. Okay. I, I, I guess I just want to point out that a, a previous applicant this evening said in no uncertain terms that if we didn't fund them, that they would find some way, come hell or high water, to move forward with their project. And we did not investigate with them more fully what that would mean, how they would do that, what the other mechanisms were, how that would change their timeline. So they, they're very, very different projects. But again, I think it comes down to trying to uh, use uh, fair and, and equivalent criteria for different projects. And I, I'm not sure it's fair to hold this applicant to a standard um, that we have not held to in the past two hours. Um, we also didn't ask, you know, Historic Northampton about, you know, maybe there could be some other grant for restoring the sign or what, are they just going to throw the sign in the trash if we don't give them the money? I mean, you know, this is just not, this is not a fair standard as, as I see it. Um, so it may be something that we want to consider doing in the future, but in this particular moment, I, I don't think that, um, that that's equitable. Any other questions for Paul and Rich? Jen? Um, I would just request if possible, um, I think it would be really helpful for me in supporting my understanding of the public good of this structure to have some outside, um, either the public or um, people with more knowledge than I on historic preservation, um, writing or speaking in support of this project. So if that's something that you all were able to bring to the next meeting, I would be really interested in hearing that and understanding that better. So Rich and Paul, again, the, uh, a week from tonight on the third is the public comment section. Uh, any folks that you feel uh, would present your case are, are certainly welcome to, to, to come. Um, also keep in mind that uh, we are a recommending body to city council. Uh, if we don't move a project forward, city council cannot revisit that. In other words, if we were to deny you funding, they can't, they can't come and say, oh, we want to fund you. If we are to support your funding, this would be something that they now would have a second look at. And generally speaking, I think there's been one exception in the entire uh, time that this committee has been in operation where the mayor uh, did not agree and I think put, a, put, put her foot down on a project. But, um, in this case, again, this is a unique project for us because it's a private business. We've never had that. The um, dependent housing solutions is unique for us because it's an affordable housing project with a for-profit component. So we have really two projects that, that we haven't had to deal with, but we haven't had the opportunity to deal with before. And again, all, we will recommend or not recommend, and those we recommend, city council will have another look at. So just, just putting that out there. Um, other questions again for Paul and Rich? Yes, uh, Dan. Thanks, Brian. Just, just confirming, I, th I thought I saw on the application, the Northampton Historical Commission does support uh, the application deeming the building historically significant and worthy of restorations. Is that, that correct? That, that uh, is correct. 
Okay. Martha, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, the commission um, discussed the application, reviewed the application, and we what we stated is that we support we supported the application being put forward because we um, that you know we believe that this is a, is a historically significant structure, but obviously are not able to weigh in on the legality of it um, for the CPC so, or whether it meets the guidelines. But obviously it's a yeah very important historic structure in the downturn. There's absolutely no question about that. Thank you, Martha. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? For Paul and Rich. I'm always uh, struck in this committee about how articulate people are in forming their questions and how thoughtful people are in bringing their expertise and their knowledge and their interest to this committee. So thanks everybody for hanging in there for uh, about three hours with very different, different proposals uh, that, are, that are out there. Um, so again, Paul and Rich, we have just a tiny bit more business. You're welcome to check out now or to, or to stick around. Um, thank you. Check thank, out. you. <laughs> thank you again for hanging in there for, for so long. Uh, moving on on the agenda, a financial update. Sarah, is there anything to add for us? Uh, as same time? as last time. Um, I can go into it more in detail when the committee starts the recommendations, if you'd like, or if anybody has any questions or needs anything in particular. And happy to answer that or provide something additional. Uh, great, thank you. Any questions for Sarah on the finances that would be helpful uh, in, in the, as we begin to mull these null mull these questions over? Are we good to go on that? Yeah. Okay. Um, once again, I, I I appreciate so much. Uh, the opportunity to have this discussion and how much I learn in the course of an evening. Again, from pickleball to disabled homeless to a barn restoration to a facade repair in a gallery, it's been quite an evening. Uh, is there any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published? No, is there a motion to adjourn? For God's sakes, it's been three so hours. Someone, so moved, so moved. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think Jeff had his hand. Jeff had his hand up for a second. Um, so uh, the third will be interesting. We will uh, uh, most likely commit the entire meeting to hearing public comment. I can't imagine that we will begin to have our discussion. And I think as we've talked about in other meetings, it's been most useful to to contain our our discussion over whether or not to fund applicants to a single evening. If we start in one evening and then move on two weeks, we've, we've forgotten a lot of it. So does that make sense that, uh, to, to, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing nodding heads, I think. Uh, so we'll, we will, again, limit our, our meeting in a, in a week to, um, to public input and then move on on the, what is it, 17th of November to our deliberations, which should be quite, quite interesting this, this session. Um, great. See you, everybody. Have a wonderful week. And we will see you in a week. Our third will be our third week in a row. So, how lucky are we? So, thanks everyone for a three hour meeting.